Yes, final kia ora. Welcome back to another episode here on Runner Straight. Our guys are still in Samoa. Ephraim Dills is over there. And then the man himself, who has now got the new name, Koro Wurumu. Welcome in, everyone. Welcome into the show. <laughs> kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, Boys. Hello, hello. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Uh, good to see you, fellas. Hey, I just want to apologise quickly. If there's some crackling and uh, our feed's a little bit off, it is what it is. We're doing our best. They're in Samoa, and we're trying to bring you the beautiful game of rugby league here on Run Australia. So thank you guys for tuning in. Again, like always, man, keep subscribing, keep liking, keep uh, sharing the love. Uh, but anyways, uh, we're here to talk about rugby league and Ethram, what's going on and what's happening? Well, I think we've got to start with the big massive news uh, coming out of the Kiwis camp. The new coaches. Adam, you'll know all about that because you're one of them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I, know, I know before we started the show, we said bring some energy, brother. And I need a little bit more than that, man. Like, it's important, isn't it? It's important. Start that one again. Go. It I is. Go. It's so brilliant to see that uh, Koro Adam Blair, he is one of the Kiwis coaches. He's part of Stacey Jones' staff. This is amazing news for the world. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Hey, um, yeah, thanks, team. It's... Um, yeah, it's definitely a great opportunity for myself. Um, a place that's given me so much um, opportunity. Uh, a place that's given me so much purpose. Um, you know, I've played 51 test matches for New Zealand and to be able to give, I guess, my knowledge and my experience back to the place that gave me so much. Um, and a great opportunity to obviously even work alongside the likes of, obviously, the legend, I think, Stacey Jones, uh, Nate Kalis, who's a, a World Cup winning captain. Um, Steve Price, who's been there and knows what it takes after the, on the back of the 30-0 the, the defeat to Australia. And then some really good people, Steve Kearney, still around there looking after some of the space as well. So uh, although I, I'm, I'm grateful and ready for this opportunity, uh, we've got to just keep building momentum on the back of what we've already created. Yeah, I love uh, what Stacey's done. And congratulations, Blairy. Yep. Huge uh, appointment for yourself. And uh I know you'll add a lot to the team and what Stacey's done is surround himself with experience. Experience, um, knowledge, but mana. There's so much experience within that black jersey and I know the players that you guys will be leading will be able to lend and feel that mana and what the black jersey is about when you guys get in together in camp. It's great to see Steve Kearney, see mm. Mooksy back in the game, see him around, uh, cultural advisor. Yep. Um, you know, very proud Māori, proud Kiwi. He'll bring that knowledge and that experience. But, yeah, there's some captaincies for mm. the Kiwis in there. So much experience. And as you said, Pricey has been around the group for a couple of years now. Was with Madge, went to the World Cup. Obviously was with them in that successful campaign mm. last year. So he brings a bit of an Aussie flavour, but mm. also some coaching knowledge and experience there. So, yeah, really good squad. Really happy for Stacey to surround himself buy some of that experience and bring him in to give him that support that he needs in his first big test. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge test, um, especially on the back of what's already been created from Madge. And um, yeah, important for, for me, and when I look at it, um, Kura Wurumu, um, it's about having the right people <laughs> around that gives the players belief but creates an, an opportunity and a culture of success. Eh? And, um, you know, you can have all the, like we have, the past players, the captains, the this group of leaders, as in, I mean coaches, but you still got to get the job done. And uh, for, for me, and a big part of what I want to try and create is for these guys to just believe in their ability that they're the best players in New Zealand in their position so that when we get to those those big moments, they make the most of those big moments. And um, we will try and create those opportunities for them. We will try and create an environment of purpose and what I said at the start of, of opportunity and belief so that when our kids come through and our, our younger generation of kids are coming through for New Zealand, they represent at the highest level and they understand, I guess, the history, the pathway that's been created from the people before them, but also when they get that jump on that they go out there and do New Zealand proud, themselves proud and their family proud. Yeah, and wh whichever team you play for at whatever level, the ultimate thing is about the results, is yep. about the game. But it's also important that whatever level it's at, and this is test match footy, that when they come into camp, they leave having mm. grown mm. and become better for their knowledge. So what I'm getting at is I'm really big on the history mm. and the legacy of what the jersey means and having you guys around that 
will give these young fellas that are playing an opportunity to learn a bit about what they're representing, yep. what it means to put that jersey on, who went before them, and what shoulders they stand on. So, yeah, it's really great. They've got you guys as former Kiwis, 51 tests for yourself. And there must be nearly 300 tests within that mm. coaching group. So those guys will definitely become better for the knowledge they'll get, both rugby league but also history-wise and culture-wise. Mean. Thanks, team. Yeah, congrats, Adam, <laughs> again. Uh, well done. I'll be looking forward to the free tickets for the TV <laughs> games for the Run It Straight crew. Yo, <laughs> yo. Nice. Uh, <laughs> Jeez, you found some energy there. Yeah, nah, you're real, we'll quick, real quick to jump at that. <laughs> we'll move on to the World Cup in 2026, uh, which has now been confirmed to be hosted by Australia, as well as some games in uh, PNG. So the the, the tournaments, it's three World Cups in one. There's the men's with 10 teams, the women's with eight teams, and then eight wheelchair teams. I've never seen any wheelchair rugby league, but I'm assuming it would be pretty cool. I've seen wheelchair bu rugby, kind of like basketball, I think. But yeah, so uh, exciting news. You might be the coach, hopefully until then. Yeah, well, yeah, fingers crossed, eh? Um, you've got to do <laughs> outstanding. Is that how we're going to go? I guess yeah, we're in a pretty tough tough position as coaches, eh? And I guess, like like we've both said, it, it's important that we actually create a place of purpose, but also success as well, and um, a great opportunity. And I, I would have loved to have New Zealand involved in this World Cup as well, as in playing some games here in New Zealand. But again, Australia has taken the rights to that. I think PNG's involved in this one as well, so... Um, you know, I guess world-class stadiums in Australia is great for the game of rugby league. Um, a great opportunity for the World Cup to be moved, obviously, from France because I don't know what happened over there. Most it was money and stuff like that. So the NRL is obviously coming real hard and Australia government has given Australia an opportunity to, to have the World Cup there. It's great, I think, you know, with the players and the competition that we have, it has grown over the time to be able to have the games back in Australia. It's great. My my issue, and there's only 10 teams, so there's only 10 teams, and if I think about it, the pooling goes 3-3-4, three, 3-3-4, three, four, three, three, four, and I think the two threes are going to be the winner out of the top team in the two threes and the top two in the, the, the four. So my problem is what does that look like? And I'm thinking if this is an Australian World Cup, if this is an Australian World Cup, they're not putting them in the three, they're putting them in the four to give them a second chance, okay, if someone lose. So we're interested to see how the pooling goes, but I definitely think it might be a little bit uh, suspect if you see the Australians in the four, four pool because you're going to come up against the likes of Samoa, Tonga, New Zealand. I'm surely they're going to split them up a bit too. Yeah, it'd be interesting, like you say, see how it is, Paul. But, yeah, congratulations to Aussie. I know uh, it's... It is in most sports, and, and it is the case in rugby league, where it's such an honour to be able to represent your country at a World Cup, and not, not many people get to do it. And this time around in rugby league, you've got to wait a little bit longer because, as you said, France were the initial host, mm. um, and I think it came down to the government pulling the money out that they had allocated, and it may have had something to do with the Olympics. But, um, again, that's to rugby league's loss. But we've got to make this one a winner. As you said, there's only 10 teams, which means some countries miss out, unfortunately. Um, but the World Cup, you were talking about it, Ephraim um, having three different World Cups in one. It's how they did it the last time around at the World Cup in England. They had the women's, they had the men's. Yeah. Uh, the wheelchair rugby league World Cup, uh, which Great Britain won. They beat France, who were the holders. An amazing game. Amazing game, wheelchair rugby league. Mm. And as far as viewers were going, I think it got the second most viewers. Such was the, ga the game. They're fearless mm. in the wheelchairs. It's, it's an awesome sport to watch. Um, so, yeah, I think it'll be another great World Cup for them. But just makes it a festival. Yeah. Makes it a festival feel to the point where the wheelchair rugby league final, I think, was the day before Samoa played Australia. And... The women, they were the curtain raiser to the men's. So the festival runs alongside each other, but they finish together, which is mm. um, a great celebration for rugby league because our game is just bigger than the men and it's growing and growing with the women as well. And moving along to some signings news. Uh, so we got three players here that have got some interesting situations, specifically the first guy, John Bateman. So he's been released uh, effective immediately by the Tigers to go join Warrington Wolves. Uh, for the rest of this season. 
but he's still contracted to the Tigers for the next two years after this year. So that's a pretty weird one, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a strange carry-on, if you ask me. Uh, the fact that they're letting them go mid-season, they make the announcement mid-game when they're playing the Warriors on Friday night. Um, you know, you either do it before the game or after, but the fact that they've announced some news during the game um, is crazy. But he's going to Warrington for the rest of the season, but they're also coming out and saying he'll be back next year to um, play the last two years. I know... There's been clubs in Wakefield, one of them, that are challenging to come up into Super League. The, his name's been mentioned with them. They're spending some big money and already have announced some big-name players that will they'll play for Wakefield next year. So they want to challenge in Super League. There's no doubt that um, someone of John Bateman's ability would help them. But, yeah, um, he's going to strengthen Warrington in the immediate. They had a big win over Wigan. Uh, on the weekend, they're challenging for the top of Super League. They've been to a couple of grand finals, want to finally get their hands on it. Um, John Bateman could help them do that this year. But, yeah, really strange. that It's not usually done where you let mm. someone go and then he's going to come back. Uh, I don't know if there's some off-field stuff that he wants to go home and see his daughter or not, or whether he's just a bit homesick. But, yeah, it's, it's a crazy move for me. Yeah, it's it's a weird one because it's not typically known in the NRL to do something like this where you still have two years going on your existing contract. They go now with six games to go with the situation that the West Tigers have been in all year anyway and to lose someone of his calibre, yes, he may not be performing to the standards that he wants to be performing at, but the, you could say that about a lot of other players as well. Um, but then to go now and then... Think he's going to come back like that for me that's where i get stuck is that well like why are you going now and then will you be coming back because the tigers have said that he'll be back in two years but it just gets a little bit messy for me is they need someone like him now on the field performing to get him off the bottom of the table they're, they're battling for the bottom of the wooden spoon and there's still a chance of being able to get off there them and Parramatta are quite close together at the minute and every game counts for the West Tigers if they want to get off and every player fit player and a healthy player needs to be on the field and he's a big part of of rugby league here in Australia and then for the West Tigers and um, to let him go now uh, to help someone else you know with, to get their job done over there is, is a weird weird situation to be in and to be able to announce it or to announce announcing it like on a Friday uh, where they're going to play a game against the Warriors that need to you know put in to get the result um, yeah real strange that the West Tigers with everything that's going on with their club this year allow someone to go now and then say that he's going to be coming back so I still feel like that's a weird situation to be in. Yeah, and then it comes out that he's had a bit of a pop at Benji Marshall, you know, about senior players being yep. treated differently to the junior players. But the fact that he's come out and said something means that, yeah. you can't bring someone back no. into that environment if he's had a crack at the coach. Well, definitely, if he's talking about some of the situations that they've been in and him being able to, or him talking to the coach and saying these things, and then it's come out in the media. There's more to the situation than just letting him go and then and hope that he's going to come back. And I think if, if you've spoken, if they've got a great relationship, then yeah, that's okay. But I don't know if they do have, um, this is just assuming, but to be able to tell the, tell the media that the problem right now is that Benji's looking after the younger guys and treating them better than the older guys and then going, oh, well, you can go and finish off the season over in the Super League and then come back in two, uh, for your last two years. I just don't see it happening, eh? No, it makes things very awkward if he mm. was to go back. Well, definitely. Now that he's come out and said what he said, of course it makes it awkward, eh? Yeah. And then the fans are going, well, is he here or is he not? You know, it's the fans that come and pay their monies. It's the sponsors that look after the uh, the, the West Tigers. It's them that turn up and, and show their support week in, week out, and that one of their marquee players are taken off and everyone starts asking questions. Yep. The other two signings are a bit more straightforward than that. Um Kyle Ero and Trey Fuller, both two-year extensions to the end of 2026. Uh, Fuller elevated to the top 30, as he deserves from how good he's been when he's filled in this season. Uh, but that's a bit more positive for their clubs. Yes, yeah, some positive news for both clubs. I think both both had a real great season to NRL. I think Kyle's been 
you know, working his butt off down in, down in the lower grades, but always been around that, that NRL level. And the way that he's performed for the Sharks this year, I think it's been a, a real revelation into what they've been able to do to, to move someone like Sefa Talakai, who was the centre position that was holding it down, to be able to now own that starting centre and to be able to be playing the way he does. Um, I think it's an outstanding uh, result for him. Uh, for his hard work, his perseverance to be able to keep turning up and still putting in performances at the moment right now that are his quality of a centre. Um, so it's great for the Sharks, it's great for Cole. Um, and then obviously with the the Dolphins, um, man, he's worked so hard, Fula. I think um, every time he's been put in the team, he's actually worked his butt off to get to where he is. Um, he's been solid at the fullback. Yes, there's a, he's had a few ups and downs with some mistakes, but... He never stops trying. He's tough. He throws his body at everything. He runs back real, uh, runs back with intent. His contact is he has intent with his defence. He's not shy or scared of getting stuck in, uh, which is a great reward for someone that's, you know, most probably was sitting down below the the NRL squad, but he's making the most of his opportunity. It just shows that you're an opportunity away from getting an opportunity. Eh? And, and I think in, in rugby league, it's really hard when you're not in first grade uh, and you're sitting down in the, a Queensland Cup or the New South Wales Cup or in the pathways uh, to see the light at the end of the tunnel is really hard. But to keep working hard and when that opportunity comes to turn up and put in the performance that he has done, it's a reward for everything that he's done. And he should be proud of that. And I think he's not going to let anyone down, especially at the Dolphins. No. And I am I correct in thinking that he's 28? Yeah, a little bit older. So, he, you know, he's yeah. well and truly bided his time to prove what he's worth. There's a couple of things for me with the Dolphins. Um, you know, they're keeping someone who's been very, very good, but they're also stopping any other club from having him because mm. he could get a job anywhere yeah. else. And we've, whilst we're pretty lucky in the game to have superstar fullbacks throughout the comp, he could be the next one. That's how freaky he is. Mm. They may be looking forward to the future or... Christian Wolf may be looking at possibly moving Hammer up, up yep. the field yep. into the centres next season to give this young fella more game time yep. at fullback because there's no doubting that he is worthy of a starting position in that position at the back of the field for the Dolphins. So they're a great signing for them. It looks like a a popular character. When he scores, you see how the players react to him. Yep. So he looks like he's popular amongst the group, around everyone. Kale another one who patient, as you mm. said, three or four years in New South Wales Cup, sounded like he got a bit frustrated and yep. probably rightly so, wasn't getting his chance. And then finally he gets it and he doesn't give it up. And once he got it this year, as you said, Sefa Talakai, who was an origin centre, mm -hmm. that's how good he was going. His form pushes him out, pushes him to the bench or even to the back row yeah. to start. Um, says a lot about how well he's played. Um, glad he's got a two-year deal. Mm. Happy for him. Um, hopefully it's the start of him. It's only year one yep. in first grade. He's still got some learning and he's uh, not a fully fledged and yep. you're not a fully fledged NRL player until you play a couple of seasons. So mm. he's got some ways to go, some ways to learn, but he's on the right trajectory. Definitely. Well, and for his team, the Sharks, this goes into our next news bit. Uh, Tom Brady is reportedly being uh, looked at to commentate the Warriors versus the Raiders game in uh, Vegas next year. That is a very interesting move. I don't know how much Tom Brady knows about rugby league right now, but uh, would you guys be excited if he was the commentator? Like, you guys are obviously commentators back here. Yep, uh, it'll be an interesting space. Um, I guess, like, as someone of his, obviously, stature is great for the game of rugby league and his promotion, it's um, getting someone that's you know, really popular in the States uh, and his realm of sports, his realm of sports. So I'd love to see him actually dummy run one first and see how he goes. Um, the first and foremost is pronunciation of names. Um, we are real hard, especially here in New Zealand, on making sure that we pronounce the names properly because it comes with... Uh, it comes with family. Uh, so we already have problems or troubles with pronunciation names in this competition anyway. And the important thing for someone like him is to understand what the game is, to, to follow the game for at least the next, you know, 10 weeks or 20 weeks or just till the finals. Um, maybe watch a Warriors game, maybe watch a, a Canberra game and, and try and analyse the game and talk about the game of rugby league that way. But um, 
I guess it's an it's an opportunity where the NRL are trying to expand and get more viewers in because of his stature over in America. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it is. Um, but I just think that, man, we've got enough knowledge in Australia of legends and players that have played the game before that do we need to go there and have someone someone that hasn't watched the game regularly consistently over the years or has played in the game to be able to speak. And I th- all I think about is just uh, it's viewers coming in, it's more money. Um, that's how I see it. So the game's trying to expand, and I feel like it's it's more of a, a plea to bringing eyes into the screens, American viewers, uh, and also obviously more money to, to the game of rugby league. Yeah, I, I get all those reasons for the off-field stuff commercially, what it means. Fox is a big mm. uh, broadcaster of our game in Australia and he's signed a massive deal for Fox mm. in America. I think he starts this season, that contract to commentate in the NFL. So he's getting into that that TV space. My question would be, what role would it be in the commentary? Um, he couldn't do, I don't think, the full game, yeah. punditry and Sydney are giving advice. Yeah. He just doesn't know the game. It's a, you know, whilst it's the Olympics, it's going yesterday. It's like me trying to um, commentate handball. Yeah. Something that I don't know. You know, I, I'd, I'd practice, I'd try and learn, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it justice. And nothing disrespectful about Tom Brady. He's just not from our game. Yeah. If he's going to sit on a panel before the game and yeah. give his thoughts and sit at half time, that may be fine. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the game, Tom? Yeah. What do you like about the yeah. game? I, I think that'd be great. Yeah. I think it'd be awesome for that. And he'd be able to sit in a position to do what Fox want and sell the game. Yeah. Sell the game from an American perspective to American eyes and ears. Yeah. But he is a superstar, global, mm. you know, one of the most successful sporting people in American history. So he would attract some viewers. He would yes, attract sir. some people to the game. So I get that. I get that all. But please don't try and bring him in as an expert because yeah. and don't sell it that way. Yeah, I think he'll come on as a panellist. I think, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's You want the guys that actually truly believe in the game uh, to speak and be passionate about the game that we deliver. And I think, like you said, I think pre-game, half-time, post-match, and the questions are real real simple. You know, how can we grow this game in America? Uh, what did you like about the game? What didn't you like about the game? What didn't you understand, you know? And how can you help the viewers, American viewers, understand the game that we're trying to deliver to them because we're there for the next, well, we signed a five-year contract. This is year two coming in. Um, So how can we give the audience a a better understanding from his point of view, American point of view, with his stature, a better opportunity to understand what we're trying to create over there in in the States and how can we get more viewers and bring more sponsorship and money through. So as a panellist, yeah, perfect. I think he would fit perfectly in this, but no, as someone that commentates the game, it's just too far off for, for me. Yeah. Shout out to Tom Brady. Uh, we'll see you when we head to Vegas next year, my bro, Chirkaz. Uh, anyway, moving on to the next thing. <laughs> it, NRLW round one it began uh, on the weekend as well. Uh, and there was some events happening, uh, which we'll get into. Uh, congrats to the winners of the first five games, the Knights, the Sharks, the Eels, the Titans, and the Raiders with our very own friend, Madison Bartlett. Uh, But, yeah, did you guys watch many of those games? Yeah, I know we said um, last week, Willie, that um, I said I wasn't going to watch it, but I actually watched the first game and I thought it was a cracker. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Newcastle, um, you know, what a game under, but a pressure too, most of the game against the Roosters. And the Roosters had most of the ball, put them under pressure, but managed defensively. I thought they were outstanding, the uh, the Newcastle woman. Um, Hung tough and then managed to come home really strong. But if you look at the whole you know, weekend of, of women's rugby league. Man, the quality is so much better than where it has been, but it's growing the game of rugby league. And everyone that's playing the game plays a big part in the role of growing the sports as well. And, you know, to open up with the Roosters, who's such a, uh, you know, has won grand finals previously. Newcastle are now going for their third uh, premiership, uh, you know, trophy in a row. And to open up with those two high-profile clubs, I thought, man, what a way to start the NRLW season. And it only just kicked on from there. So a great weekend of rugby league for the women's space and a great way to start off the, the competition with those the two heavyweights. Yeah, we spoke about uh, the Origin series earlier on in the season and that set a pretty big standard mm. 
um, for the NRLW, but what a way to kick it off, as you said. I just, yeah, the skill level, um, the quality of the football, but the tempo, tempo was really, really quick. Mm. It was end to end. Uh, they got into some pretty good arm yep. wrestles and the quality of uh, Tamika Upton shone through the first half and then the Roosters had a mini comeback but just couldn't yep. quite get it done in the end. But I thought the Knights yeah, showed their championship quality in the end to get it done. But across the board, as I said, the tempo of the games and the quality, the fitness and skill yep. level is, is something that really stood out for me over the course of the weekend and something I think that will get better as the season goes on. It's only nine games. Yep. It's only a nine-game season. So I think all the coaches will be just telling their players just leave everything out there and go yep. for it. Well, what, what do you think? I, I, I know, I'm watching that Newcastle game, uh, and this is just my thought. And wait, I know that they can all attack, but I think defensively, if you can be the best offensive team in the NRLW, you're a big chance of winning the comp. And I just go on the back of what I saw Newcastle do. They turned up for each other. They, their line speed was really good on the try line. Um, that try just before halftime uh, where she gets tackled in the corner right on halftime. The commitment for each other to work really hard. I think if you can be the best, this is just my thought, if you can be the best offensive team in the NRLW, you're more likely to be there in the end because you can withstand the pressure that the game is creating now and the skills of the opposition by getting in their face and putting them under a bit of pressure. And I thought that's what Newcastle did, although they were sitting on their line a fair bit and the Roosters kept continuously putting them under pressure, they kept turning up for each other. And that was just kind of my thinking when I watched that game, I was thinking, you know, if you can coach an NRLW team to just be real good defensively because they have all the attack, that they will go close to winning the comp. Yeah, and they've got a real strong steel-mindedness about them. And as you said, their effort to work and those teams that have that work ethic to cover each other because mm. defensively you're never perfect. Yeah, Someone's always going to slip off or overread. And if you've got that willingness and that ethic to cover each other and then make those tackles in the corners when they do try and make a break, you're always going to go a long way because that's, yeah. that's a sign of your team spirit and your will but physically they throw themselves at them. Mm. There was a time there just before half time when uh, Millie Boyle nearly went over to score. Yeah, Just some last gasp effort to stop her from scoring on a one-on-one -on -one tackle. Great efforts from the, from the Knights across the board, both teams. Also, Willie, I've just noticed, and this is over the weekend, um, the woman in the middle of the park, I, I didn't see too many of them offload the ball, offload the ball. There is offloads on the outside, back row of centres, wingers, but I think when I'm, again, I'm going back to the defence, if like in that Millie Boyle tackle was a prime example, hit straight underneath the ball, falls over the top of her, but doesn't really, there's opportunities to offload the ball. But I'm not seeing too many middle players offload the ball because they're just straight up and down yeah. at the minute. So I think the next part of the growth of the game is for those women in the middle of the park is to use their feet, create space by that, either dive down and get a quick play of the ball, or use your feet to be able to create an offload or a post-line or pre-line offload. Eh? I think yeah, I, I've just only just, again, I just watched the last, the, this round's games, and I may be wrong as I, it goes on to the season, but I want to keep an eye on um, the, the front rowers, especially on if they're doing too much offloading after the line or pre-line pre or anything like that, because some of these guys, that, girls that are tackling really well under the ball, they're just chopping them and they're falling down, but I think there's an opportunity to promote the ball. That probably brings up a question that's been thrown about uh, in some quarters uh, about the size of the footy. Okay, yep. And some yep. people are saying, you know, a smaller ball might be able to help the game with what you're saying, grip on the ball yep. and get an offload, a um, better passing game, kicking game um, in the NRLW. Um, but some people, some athletes that I've spoken to, um, women rugby league players, they're not going for it. They're happy to play with that sort of, yep. with the same size ball as it is at the moment. Um, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure. Yeah, I've yeah, still yeah. got to watch and see because, as you said, they still get offloads on the edges. Yeah. And some of it may just be awareness. Yeah. Awareness and push. Yeah. You need that support runner to, yeah. Because when Millie Boyle got through, there was no support runner. Yeah. Had there been someone, she may very well have yeah. passed it. Yeah. So, yeah. And some of that's got to be coached and yeah. encouraged. Yeah. And that may be a big area that, they do develop and grow in, in the confidence and skill. Yeah, I definitely think they just yeah you know, carry the ball real hard, which is which is fine. Um, but I just think if there's something that they can add on moving forward, is to 
create the space with your footwork rather than just trying to run over yeah. the top of a, another woman. You know what I mean? And I think if there's, there's something to grow in the game, it's the middle forwards using their feet rather than just tucking the ball underneath their arm and just running straight at the person in front of you. So, I don't know. Well, as far thinking. as the men's game in the last 20, 25 years, that's been probably the biggest area of growth. Yeah. Um, I remember when we when I first started, front rows never passed. No. You never passed in your own 20 mm. and front rows never passed the ball. Yeah. But we've learned through people like James Graham yep. that we can be skillful as front rowers, we can play football, we, we can pass, we can offload, we can use some footwork. So that may be where they go with yeah. the, you know, the next evolution of their game. Yeah, well, just one in the clock bag, you said um, James Graham. I think Roy Asatasi may have started something similar to that with his footwork. I think he was before James Graham. And I think he was kind of most probably for me the changing of the guard when it comes to footwork and passing the yep. ball, real late footwork at the line. So, yeah, I think both of us, you know, like you said, um, a development in the women's space is to be able to coach something like this rather than just going, bam, get it forward and get down and play the ball. Yeah. Well, you talk about front rowers and their feet in the NRLW. How about front rowers and their hands? Uh, if we talk about <laughs> Aneta Nuosala. Uh, got a bit of biff in the in the first round of NRLW. Yeah, it's um, you don't see that um, anymore, really. To be honest, let's be honest, you don't really see that, and you can't do it anymore. And um, yeah, a bit of push and shove there, uh, and then you know threw a threw a punch in the face, and on the back of that, a, a hip drop as well. So um, you know the the women's space is firing up. I saw, um, I think, in the St George game and the Titans game, there's a bit of push and shove as well. And uh, everyone knows that you can't punch, but there's still a lot of pushing going on. So I think it's getting, and, and this is where the game's going, it's getting real competitive. Uh, these girl, these women are starting to be getting close to being professional athletes, uh, whether some of the rugby girls are just playing all year round anyway. So it's, real, it's getting real heated in the middle of the park and even on the edges, contact's getting bigger. Um, the competition is growing. Um, spots are up for grabs every week. Um, they are so consistent with their consistent with their performances. So the the product is growing. The game is is developing, and these girls are just getting stuck into each other. And you're going to have these moments. Um, you know, the hip drops. No one goes out there to coach this. So if you get put in awkward positions, but then again, you know, sticking up for each other, your teammates, and then it gets a bit of a push and shove. And yeah, I was quite surprised to see a, a punch thrown. That's for sure. Yeah. It is. It's where we're at as a game and where we want our players to be is emotionally invested in their team and in their game and in their performance. And, you know, there's a fine line. There's a fine line mm. to where we take our discipline and sometimes it boils over that line. And you know, whether it's the guys or the girls, you know, the game is played with that amount of passion. Mm. And sometimes it does boil, spill over. But, yeah, we've gone past the days where you can close your fist and, and throw yeah. one. But... Yeah, you've got to be careful when you do that sort of stuff. There's been a lot of pushing and shoving the last couple of weeks, which I don't necessarily agree with because um, it's allowed people who back in the day would never have been cheeky because somebody would have sorted them out. And, uh, you know, that's the ugly side of it. They know they're not going to get a hit or even a slap, but sometimes uh, maybe they do need one. But, um, yeah, that's just you know, the girls, they, they're they playing at that level now. They're up there emotionally high, protecting each other as a team. This is what we coach, yeah. look after each other, protect each other, and that's what they're doing. Yeah, bring it back, I reckon. That's the one. <laughs> that's <it. laughs> no, no, I'm not encouraging that stuff. I'm not encouraging. That stuff's long gone, guys. That's right, you guys heard what Adam said. Bring the biff back in the NRLW. That was no, going to be mean. Say that. Uh, that's basically no, no, what he I, said. I, 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 he apologised. He apologised. Throw him under the bus. No. Okay, you heard what I said. Bring the biff back. No. <laughs> uh, we'll move on now to the NRL. Please do. Uh, and the first game, the game that everyone wants to hear every week, uh, Warriors versus Tigers. 12-point win for the Warriors, uh, keeping their finals hopes alive. You were the water boy, eh, Adam? <laughs> No, well, no, I was the water boy for the New South Wales Cup team, my bro, which is the team just under oh, NRL. Man. So, yeah, yeah, you didn't see that game. It was on TV too. Uh, my brother didn't get it over in Samoa. But, yeah, so I was the water boy for the, the New South Wales Cup team, blue shirt runner. Um, yeah, it wasn't a good night for us, but we're not talking about our New South Wales Cup team. It's the Warriors on Friday night against the West Tigers. For me, I, I think that this... this 
sh- the way that they won wasn't the prettiest game. Um, you know, we spoke to three players, or we heard from three players after the game, Mitch Barnett, the captain, uh, Adam Fanor blake and Chanel Harris-DeVita. All three of them spoke about defence uh, and how they were disappointed in some of the tries that the Tigers scored and disappointed in some of the opp- or the missed opportunities that they had defensively where the, they didn't make their tackles. And also spoke about the errors that, that um, came into the game late. I thought... Like this is game they had to win, and they got the win. No matter what the way they got it done, it was ugly. It wasn't the best 80-minute 80 per, 80 performance, but they needed to get this win. I thought the Tigers turned up with a great mindset and attitude to play some football, which is what they have been showing in the last few games. They've been able to score like 30-plus points. Um, Defence has let them down, but I thought defensively, although they lost the game, I thought I saw a big change and shift in mindset with the Tigers Um can attack from everyone on the field. We know that. We understand. They scored some great tries. Um, defensively, you know, they had to repel the Warriors a fair bit of the time on their trial in the first half. And, you know, they were only 14, was it 14 nil at half time? And I thought they still, the Warriors allowed them to get a little sniff and stay in the game. And uh, this is where I think the Warriors should have kicked on and, and, and should have kicked on, but they didn't uh, and kept the Tigers in the hunt. And I think there was only like, what, 10, 15 minutes to go, 14, 14, 6. And they were playing some football, the West Tigers, but didn't manage to come away with the win. Warriors will be grateful and, ha- and happy that they got the two points because it's, it's a win. Uh, but they wouldn't be happy with that performance. Uh, but anyway, ugly shape or form, they got it done. Uh, back to the drawing board and, and have to work really hard into the next game against Parramatta Eels. Yeah, I thought they attacked really well, the Warriors. I, they are dangerous when they move the footy and they've got that youthful exuberance about them, the Tigers, um, with very little fear to play. And at the moment, they don't really understand the consequences yeah. of some of that because of that inexperience. But I thought defensively, they missed a beat a couple of times. And yeah. uh, I was happy for the Warriors that they exposed Got some joy down that left edge. Yep. They were very dominant, yeah. um, especially through Capewell that first try. And um, Ali Lautau got over for, awesome. a, for a try. And it was fantastic. I thought him and uh, his centre partner, Moala Graham Tolfa, yeah. was very, very good. It's such um, a very good, for a young bloke, a really smart, strong defender. Mm. And I thought attacking wise, Adam Fanor Blake, Mitch Barnett, and Dallin really yeah. did a good job yeah. to get him on the front foot and get some of that advantage. You know, I agree. At half time, leading 14 0, I thought they were going to kick on and they needed to. Yeah. I think they really needed to to try and put the game away yeah. early. And there was an opportunity there. But when the Tigers scored and they scored again, you could see them grow. Yeah. There were some nerves around yeah, the stadium, there were some nerves in the grandstand. Because um, you didn't know what that young Warrior side was going to be like under that sort of pressure. But thankfully, they got the job done. Yeah. Uh, big mention uh, for um, Chanel for getting that kick and yep. just being happy and ease some pressure from the crowd. Uh, a lot of pressure from that kick from Canberra last week. And I'm glad he got to mm. put it to bed and move on with it now and finish the game in a strong way. But also, I thought for the Tigers, he's been their best all year. But his try at the end, up he could have when he was in the halves. Yeah. If you have a look at it, he, he starts on the right hand side of the field, chases the ball. Keeps pushing, keeps the lucky offload. He ends up scoring on the kick. That's that's his effort. That's what he's got, and that's yeah. what he's brought every single game. But he's not been supported. I feel for him. I mm. feel for Upi Corusel, and I'm glad he got that try for them at the end there. But you know they're in some trouble. They're in, yeah. It's a tough, tough time for them. You're talking John Bateman leaving. More experience. It's it's going to be tough at the bottom for the Warriors. They've got to be better against Power next week. Yeah, I think um, you just touched on Upi Corusel. I thought I, I like him in the nine because of his creativity, and you've seen that try that he gave Isaiah like Papali on his one fiftieth game. Uh, he shows out to the left and then comes back and put puts ice into a nice little space in behind the ruck and scores. And that's what he's been able to create this year on the back of only on the back of momentum, like any hooker. Uh, when when and he's most probably the most creative when it comes to that nine position if they've got momentum. And, and there was a quick play of the ball. He comes out, shows left, comes back to Isaiah. Isaiah hits that little line in behind the ruck and, and pretty much goes over untouched, really. Uh, scores that nice try. 
He tries his heart out. He tries his butt out consistently for the West Tigers, even when he's at seven. But I, I just like him around the middle of the park because he challenges the ruck to be better. He challenges the ruck to actually watch what's happening around him. And he's so deceptive with his passing, uh, his no looks, his playing short, his playing at the back. And everyone has to kind of stop and watch him what he does. Because um, every time, if you engage on him, you'll just play short. If you don't and you allow him to play, he gets across and normally chooses the right option. So... Um, when they started playing some football against the Warriors, and that's when we all started getting nervous, is when he was coming to the nine position. Um, he shifted from the seven into the nine, and that's when they started playing some football off the back of momentum. And like you mentioned, those three boys, you know, Mitch Barnett, Adam Fanua, Blake, and Dallin, I thought they were enormous around creating momentum for the Warriors. Um, and they didn't find it hard getting out of their own half, especially off kickoffs, 53, 54 metres every time they carried the ball. And that's never been the Warriors' issue. Um, so, you know, on the back of those three guys performing really well, you spoke about the two centres, Ali and Moala. I thought, you know, the opportunities this year for those guys to be able to grow consistently has been a year for that because of all the injuries. And I think behind those two boys, there's not too many more outside backs, to be honest. Um, you know, livid in the in the club with lots of talented, um, really, are really young forwards, middles, um, and Leka obviously is out there, Haleasima, but they've got Dimitri Sefakula, they've got Zion Mau, there's, there's some other guys down, and um, Tom Ali's down there as well, Bunty Afoa, so there's plenty of cover in, in the forwards, it's the outside back that's, that's hurting the club when it comes to injuries, but those guys that you mentioned, we're enormous. Um, centre's a hard position to defend and, and guys coming in there who I both think have X factor when it comes to centre positions like great feet, strong carriers of the ball, can create something out of nothing with given opportunities moving forward and I think they're going to get that. Uh, I don't think there's too many guys coming back into this team and those guys ha have worked their butt off in the lower grades uh, New South Wales Cup to be able to give these opportunities and not let anyone down. Yeah, and lastly, for me, I think... Uh it answered a lot of questions on the weekend. Uh, one in particular, oh. Roger's the fullback. Aye. Roger is the fullback. Yeah. Is, is the experiment done with centers? I think so. I yeah. think it is done. Yeah. You know, uh, if they're going to try it, maybe move, move Shans there. Yeah. But Roger's a fullback every single day. That kick return that he made to get to halfway, his, his strength to throw off a couple of defenders throughout the game. But his, his kick return... He gets to halfway, beats five or six defenders. They spread it out to Dallin. That's when Moala goes yeah. through and sets Dallin back up for the try. Just off the back of, of um, Roger's run. He's oh, yeah. so good. He knows where to be. And what about those three try savers? Three try saving tackles. And it was enormous for someone that hasn't played there this year properly, you know, for a full 80 minutes. And um, I think these are the highlights and the things that we all know Roger can do when he's at the, at the back of the field. I know... Um, Coach Webster was talking about that everyone would be happy to see him back there. The fans would love having him back then. I know he spoke after the game about Roger still needs to work hard at getting the numbers right on the on on the try line, which is normal for a fullback. That's your the biggest part of a fullback is getting your defensive line set properly and your numbers right on the try line so that you can guys can defend it well. But what what takes over more than anything is the will and the hunger and the competitiveness to get into a position to try and stop those tackles or try and save those tries. And, and it was three times there that he, he saved the Warriors. If it wasn't for him, they wouldn't the game the Tigers, I feel like. If if he didn't save those two tries over the try line, they scored them, they win the game. And well, one of them, massive. one of them, he had no right yeah. to be close to the ball. He was at a had to work. 15 metres from the try line. Tigers kick it through. He just had that will, that desire, that pace, and that know how where the ball was going to be. He's a fullback. Mm. He knows what to do. He's an NRL world class fullback. That's where he won the Dally M. For mine, he's going to stay there. Yeah, so the whole conversation will be when Chance comes back is, is he going into the centre position or does he go into the wing? Because I think he can play. I think Roger could be a good winger as well because you're still, although you're not catching that, that ball. If it kicks it straight to you, you can still catch the ball of high bombs and to still have that opportunity to run back through the middle. But again, you're sitting out on the wing when you're attacking. 
it's a waste of using Roger's talent and his skill and what he has. He can carry well from running those block plays. He's got a nice, strong left, right foot step. He's, he strong, carries the ball strong and can score tries. And, you know, people, like, he, he there was a moment there sometimes where he was stepping people, bumping people off. And, yeah, for me, uh, a tough decision to try and see where they put Chance when he comes back. And I know the hardest thing for Coach Webbs is... He, he, Chance is our fullback, and that's where the conversation kind of gets him into a bit of trouble. Is I've promised Chance that he's going to be our fullback here. He left because Roger was here. Roger's been out of the game for two years. Uh, Chance has crafted himself into this position. Yes, Chance is a great fullback as well, lad, but I just think to accommodate for Roger, we can't. They can't have him in the centre position because it's a waste of what he can create for the Warriors, and they're going to have some, you know, some hurdles to jump over there. Yeah, and I, I think it's a real credit to Roger yeah. how he's handled it all throughout the year. Whenever he's, the question's been posed to him, it's, I'll play where the coach yeah. puts me. I'll do what the coach yeah. wants me to I'll do what the team needs. And that's a massive credit to yeah. him. Because I think deep down he must understand that he's a fullback and yeah. everyone's screaming for him. Yeah. But for someone of his calibre and his stature in the game to say, team first, yeah. You gotta do nothing but respect and love that. Well, I think for any player that's playing in there, it's always team first. You know what I mean? Like wherever the coach says you're gonna go, you just get a job done. I just don't think it's worked out the way that the coach may have wanted it to work out. And a lot of things have happened this year for the Warriors, injury wise, and he's been shifted everywhere. But if you had your seventeen on the field consistently for the twenty one round or twenty rounds and he was playing centre and he's got to learn and develop in that position, then things may have changed. But we've seen what he can do at fullback now. Uh, and the fans are screaming for it. And I know Coach Webster always has a bit of a chuckle when he puts him at fullback and he says, you know, the fans the fans will be happy. 100% they're happy because we've seen what he can do in those fullbacks. The best, I reckon the games that he's played well, he's played at fullback. So uh, the answer for, for the fans is he is a fullback and that's what he plays. Uh, the people were loving a few weeks ago our Manawave chat that we had uh, between oh. Xavier Willison and Freddie Lussick. So I thought this week there were two Manawaves in this game as well. Uh, you had the two different styles, and I wanted to know which oh. one is better. The Dallin one, when he goes like that? Yeah. Or <laughs> the Kirk Capewell one, when he goes like that? <laughs> yeah, I, um, it's funny, eh? it's funny now, and I guess that the cool thing about it is everyone's jumping on the back of this, and, and for me it's the Aussie boys, you know what I mean? It's the Aussie boys, it's Freddie Lussick, it's now Kirk Capewell. The guys are embracing themselves and indulging themselves into the culture here, and it's become a little bit of a trend at the Warriors. Dallin has done it a lot of times, Chance has done it, so when they get these opportunities, I think he was stuck in between a, a full actual like throwing it out there and just a little, just a little <laughs> hello, a little hello boys, you know what I mean? Loving Dallin's one wide up there, bro, chucking it out there, got the witties going on as well. So I thought um, between them, you got to give uh, props to props to Katewell, uh, Kurt Katewell for throwing it out there, but Dallin for me, winded it right back and chucked the witties on was awesome. Yeah, for Freddie Lussick and for Kurt Katewell, you do nothing but endear yourself to the fans. You're, just, you're winning them over automatically when you do some of that. You know, you, you're throwing a bit of Kiwi culture out yep. there. And I thought Dallin had a bit of Steph Curry about him, a bit oh, of basketball yeah. shot, getting it up there. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, both of them. Either way, it's the intention, and the intention mm. was, was um, perfect. And last thing for this game, um, who's, whose haircut is worse? Felice Calfusi oh. or Isaiah Papali's new haircut? Oh my gosh, bro. There's some ugly things going on in this competition right now, way. Eh? And some of these hairstyles, um, there was a fella in, um, in New South Wales Cup at the Warriors, Tanner Stower Smith, who rolled in a Felice Kafusi before Felice Kafusi done it. And he was all over social media in New South Wales Cup going, bro, like, seriously, what's this fella up to? Similar to Felice, but the bro's not losing his hair. He's a young, young 19, 20-year-old who's got plenty of hair, and he's chucking a, a style like that, and I'm just like, bro, that is rude. Like, sort it out. But between those two, Felice and Isaiah, I'm just like... I'll take Isaiah's one over Felice's, I think, but still then, it's just got, like, this little patch of hair hanging down oh. there. What, <laughs> like, I know everyone calls it the horsey, but don't the horsey's back up in the middle? What's that one? Yeah, I, don't, uh, I just want to know what Felice says to the barber when he goes. It looks like... <laughs> 
<laughs> he's even got it faded. Yeah, it's yeah, fa faded. Can you just give me a back fade? I don't back. know. I, I don't know what it is and or how he does it because it looks like it is cleanly done. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not just a square cut and let it grow. But yeah, I'm not sure what the man is thinking. Um, but it's been a little while now. He's persevering with it. But yeah, when I saw. Um, Isaiah's one on telly, just that little square patch and then oh. the, the ready on the side. And yeah, I'm all for individuals, but that, and yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Hey, Willie, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. And this is for our, all our, our people out there that watch our show and keep subscribing and liking our stuff. I debuted in 2006, a long time ago. Um, I had a ready. <laughs> I didn't say here I am, here I am judging. I'm judging right now. I'm judging these players with their hairstyle. But if our our crew, our crew, which I know you guys can, find the footage of me oh. when I debuted in 2006 for the storm, you will see the rat's tail that I had. My reasoning, guess what? My this is my reasoning. So I had really long hair. So I I, I jumped between short, really short, like number one and Curly, this curly, and then long hair. And I got in trouble. I was late to the Melbourne Storm at training, and they, you have to roll a dice. I rolled a dice, and it was shave your head. And I said to Craig Bellamy back in the day, oh, I can't, this is culture. He looked at me. Hey, you live in Australia now. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. So what I did was I cut it all off, and just to have that little bit of memory, I just kept the ratty right oh. in the back. So I shouldn't be throwing stones at glass houses. The good old Madge Maguire comments. Oh, um, yeah, I had a ratty back in the day, so I know our crew will be able to find that, and maybe some oh, comparisons will be actually pretty cool. Go hunting, go hunting cool, team. Go hunting. Yeah, ready, boys. I had it. Well, you speak about Bellamy, we'll move on to, uh, he was blowing up in the Storms game in the weekend, even though they got it done over the Eels 32-14. to 14. They weren't at their best again, but again, as all season has been, they got another pretty dominant win and the Eels are still in strife. Yeah, well, I, I think um, I, they have a strong culture and hold themselves to a, a, to a level of performance. Um, so when they don't hit those marks... Craig Bellamy hits the roof normally, even when they win. Uh, and you hear a lot of the boys talk about, you know, although we won, you know, Craig wouldn't be happy with how we performed. And they are a class act in everything that they've done. And I guess the, the thing for me is Parramatta played a bit of football, and they have to now. They have to play some football. And the way that you, I guess, you compete with the Melbourne Storm is you have to play for the 80 minutes, but you have to play a style of football where it challenges them defensively. Um, I think the, the week before, they would have said that was a great performance against against the Roosters and they everything kind of clicked. Cam Munster's back in the team. I think, you know, he'll be better for the run. Uh, getting some, I guess, some footy under his belt and getting some, you know, some Ks in the legs and getting the feel of the game again. I still thought for, for someone that's been out of the game for a while and been on the sidelines, he still added some intent to what the, you know, and some, some great execution or some great kicks to the game. He is a, a dominant player on the field. So now that they've got their spine back in, I feel like, and Pappenhausen and how he's been able to play, like he's coming into his own now. He's getting some Ks under his legs. He's been able to perform consistently. And I think the disappointing thing for, for Craig Bellamy is that at times they don't play the way that they should be playing, that they know they can to the standard at the, of the Melbourne Storm. And a Parramatta team that's struggling, has nothing to play for, challenged them in the first half, but a credit to the to this Melbourne Storm, they keep turning it over, keep putting them in the grind, keep turning up for each other. Individual efforts, Papenau's been really good. Ali Katoa has had a, a, a massive year, and the things that they're doing with Jerome Hughes and now having Munster back is only going to get stronger and strengthen their chance to be in the grand final at the end of this year. Enormous. Yeah, we talk about the Melbourne Storm for a long time, and it's been about those standards and upholding those mm. standards, and whoever comes in, um, they've got an obligation to live up to those standards, yeah. and this is why they have a team that's largely made up of fellas you wouldn't have known before the start of the season. Correct. But they know what they've got to live, to, live up to. They know through their coach and what he expects and how he tells them that they've got to live up to that standard and perform every single week. You know, they've been close in some games and regardless, as you said, of the result, it's about the performance yeah. for Craig. And 
they were below par. It wasn't just about playing Parramatta and then playing well and scoring those tries in the first half and keeping the scoreline close. Mm. They went up to the mark of what they needed to be defensively. Outstanding attacking-wise, Pappenhausen back to mm. his flying best. But uh, we say it every week, and I'll say it again, Jerome Hughes is just outstanding mm. at the moment. There's a couple of plays there, and I'll talk a little bit technical here, where he lines up on the five-man, which is yeah. generally the middle, but his ability to kick out to the back row and square him up and just line up Eli Couture one-on-one with that halfback and get through untouched was outstanding. We saw it against the Warriors. We've seen it yep. almost week in and week out now. And he set up uh, Wishart for a try and then Pappenhausen scored one late on. Mm. Just outstanding the way that um, Jerome Hughes is playing. Yeah. Just taking total control. Yes, he's got Munster coming back, but he's been so instrumental to them being top of the table. Yep. And I've got to give a mention for Para, Dylan Brown. Yeah. Full of effort. A couple of long-range breaks that he worked overtime to get himself to from one side of the field to the other. He's he's still fighting. He's still got that spirit. And they're in a different battle, unfortunately. They're battling out with the Tigers for that wooden spoon, which nobody ever wants. Mm. And you can see Dylan Brown definitely doesn't want that. Well, the the funny thing with, um, I guess, Paramount, you're also playing for your, your, your jobs, uh, for, for a position to stay in the team. Um, you got an incoming coach that, has already said that there's a few people on the chopping block. Uh, we've got to let a few people go. So not only are you playing to win the games, you're playing for your position in, in the team. And if you're not performing and you, you've got an incoming coach that's watching from afar, I don't know if he's still at the Melbourne Storm yet, but I think he's going to be moving out. I think it was this weekend that he was coming over, to, going over to work in the back and at power. But you're on display for your for your incoming coach to be able to say, yep, I oh, still want him around. Um, yep, he's still putting in the effort. And I think I think the thing now for Parramatta is is the effort that you talk about with Dylan Brown is is not giving up. You know, your season's literally not over yet. You've got six games to go. Um, you don't want that wooden spoon. But showing the effort for your teammates, for the club, for the jersey is what the coaches must be looking at really now. Because you know you're not going to be in, you're not fighting for the eight position. But what you're fighting for is your position in the team. So looking for effort, looking for heart, looking for the reason why you want to play for the, the Premier League. <coughs> so, yeah, credit to those boys, that, you know, to, to Dylan Brown, that, you know, through the tough times, um, you know, and he's been through an up and down season as well, that he still fought up against a quality side of the Melbourne Storm. Because you look at that lineup, that's a decent Parramatta yeah. lineup. Yep. That's still a decent team there. It's, that's not a second to bottom team. Mm. So, yeah, they've got the ability to, to win a couple more before the season's out. Yeah, definitely. Back on a Storm side, how should their fans take the news that, uh, Come the end of the season, Cam Munster's going to need to have a double hip surgery. Oh yeah, that's um, that, I heard that on the um, the commentary, and they spoke about that. Like that's, it, I thought it was his groins. Is it like you got to get your hips sorted to do your groins? <laughs> um, like that's a major surgery if you're getting double surgery on your hips. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but man, that's a big operation for for for, for Cam Munster and to be able to bounce back on the back of that I think uh, like as a fan you'd be worried that like I just I just can't imagine having a, a surgery that take that's two surgeries to do your, like both hips and you come back bigger and better from it like that's that's my concern is is he going to be back to the Cameron Munster after this that we all know that he can be after the double hip surgery that's that's I guess that's my question for the fans to be able to understand um, but also it's going to take some some recovery some some rehab and a lot of a lot of attention because that's no that no it's just not like an ACL where you can get in there and try and fix it up or an ankle so it's most of your hips like a lot of movement comes from there. Yeah, and I suppose it's uh, it's that rare yeah. that, you know, both of us have been in the game for a long time, almost unheard of. Yeah. Um, so the recovery process isn't quite known at the moment, but to what degree is he having the surgery? I yeah. guess it wouldn't be a replacement, but they'll be shaving somewhere. And yeah. Hopefully he comes back bigger and better. And we talk about the Melbourne fans having some concern. I think the general fan will have some concerns as well. You know, he's such a good player for our competition um, and such a superstar in our game. We want those players on the field. Um, Hopefully the operation goes well at the end of the season. um, I take it he'll miss playing for Australia at the end of the year, which will be a loss for them. 
but hopefully the recovery is back in time that he can play a large chunk of next season. Mm. As I say, I don't know what the recovery time is, is scheduled to be, but yeah, that's a, that's a big, big one that affects a lot of your movements. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Interesting. We'll move along to uh, the best individual team performance of the round. Who let the dogs out? Bulldogs wow. versus Broncos, 41-16 to the dogs at Suncorp Stadium. Man, what an impressive performance from the dogs. Yeah, it was outstanding, to be honest. Um, don't know if I saw this coming, um, especially the attack. And I know, no, I guess, hold on a minute. Um, they've been speaking about the attack and how they wanted to um, try and make their battle working on their attack. And I thought you saw that right from the get-go, the shifting to the edge just to create a bit of momentum. Um, and when, you, when you've done, I guess, review on a, a position, these are the things that you're looking out for. You haven't seen any of that this season from, from the Bulldogs, and they've managed to pull the pants down of the Broncos up at Suncourt Stadium in front of a, a sold-out stadium with, you know, 35-plus uh, fans there supporting the Broncos. But they've been, for me, they've been, and this has been the year, they've been real committed to the cause defensively. Um, and I think someone like Josh Curran, who was at the Warriors last year, has been a big part of... You know, the inside pressures and getting that line speed up and everyone's buying into the, the line speed, I think, for, for the Bulldogs. I think, you know, the times that the Broncos start trying to play football and they try and they want to play an expansive round of football and use their speed, the, the the Bulldogs were just in their face every single time. The bounce of the ball, if that's on the ground, it's it's the Bulldogs are normally right there to land on top of it. And I thought by shifting the ball to the edges, creating a little bit of momentum and then playing back through them was a masterstroke from, from the coaching staff down there and something that they've been working on. So, again, I don't know if they get away with it moving forward because now everyone's seen it, but I guess that's the option that you have in the game of rugby league is you can show something, people only see something, and then now you play a little bit of shape. And I think those, those shapes for the, the Bulldogs, it's not necessarily to score tries, it's just to create a little bit of momentum and, and take the metres on offer. The, the Bulldogs, of, of the Broncos obviously thought they were just going to come through the middle of the park. They tighten up their line, a little shift, two pass to the edges, boom, boom, down the edge, and then they're creating momentum. I thought they were enormous on the edges too. Like the, the, the Bulldogs played a style of game that I thought that like that could beat any team on their day. And if we spoke about the Melbourne Storm and the way that you play the Melbourne Storm is you've got to play some football against them. The thing for me is they're buying into a system. They've had 18 months under the coach, uh, Cameron Serraldo, and they're playing a style of football, no, defensively first and foremost, that everyone turns up for each other, led by line speed. Um, I liked how they changed it up this, this week around their attack. They've always been, tr been speaking about they're good defensively but need to be able to score more points. Uh, and I said their last game against the Warriors that they scored a lot of tries from just kicks through the line. They haven't been able to break too many lines, and if they did, they were tackled short. But this week, shifting the ball to the edge, creating momentum down there, then coming back through the middle, and then going back to those edge. And those are necessarily, not necessarily try scoring plays. It's All it is is just creating momentum down the edge and then shifting the defensive line. I thought they did that really well against the Brisbane Broncos, and the Brisbane Broncos struggled to handle them. I thought, you know, and we you go through that, that dog's pack, and... They are missing someone like Max King, who has been a, a big part of what they do for the middle of the park. But they've got a, a group of workers that want to turn up for each other. And I think that's where Serrano's trying to create something similar to the Penrith Panthers, where everyone just turns up for each other, no matter the situation. Uh, and if you can pressure an opposition like the Brisbane Broncos, who try to play a fast brand of rugby league, then you force them into mistakes. And I think that's what they did really well, the Bulldogs. And they come away with the big win against them up at Suncorp. Inside, you know, 30 plus a thousand people there, fans supporting the Broncos, uh, and to get a win, a huge effort. And, and it just solidifies their place in the top, what are they, fifth? Fifth? Yeah. You know, in the top five. And and they're knocking on the door of the fourth, fourth, fourth spot and could be pushing. So, an interesting space for the Bulldogs. I think they're growing. They're growing, and we all saw that. But again, no one would have had them in the top four, let alone the top eight, or the top eight, I mean, sorry. But they are pushing and knocking on the door of uh, fighting for those positions, for sure. I didn't see this coming either. I I didn't see it coming because I thought with the return of Adam Reynolds, mm. how influential he was for the Broncos last week and what he did to open up space for Reese Walsh, I thought that was going to get better and better. Yeah. But as you said, the dogs didn't allow them to yeah. do that. They're, 
their aggression and their will to get line speed and get in their face shut a lot of those opportunities yeah. down in time. And I think that was the biggest difference for mine in this game was that the Broncos weren't willing to get any line speed and there were some real deficiencies in their defence, whereas the Broncos... They had some deficiencies, but they covered it up with their aggression the and their line speed and making errors further out than mm. on their try line. A mm. couple of examples for me that indicated the Broncos were off. You never see this, but there was a 4-4 and four four down a short side and yep. Pat Carrigan misses a tackle one-on-one. Yep. On one. Yep. You never see that. You never see him miss a one-on-one. On one. Mm. That was a sign to me they're not quite on today. The other one was uh, when the, the cow, when the dogs kicked the ball, to the sideline. Yep. And the Broncos let it bounce. Yep. They let it bounce. No everyone looks at the ball. Dogs get it, pass it back to Marty. Marty kicks it across the field. Yep. Great take, I think, from Connor Tracy yep. to set up the winger to score in the corner. They just had more desire yeah. to get to the ball and some signs there that the Broncos weren't quite on it. And they're in a tough position now, the Bronx. Mm. You know, we'll talk about the dogs being up in the five challenge challenging the four. Broncos are getting close to their season being over. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I think they're playing. That the, we go back to the dogs quickly. They they're playing a brand of football that are, that's exciting brand now. When you ch- add in that attack to it, and they've got some players in their team. Brogdon Cherry's been a like he's been out of the game for so long um, due to his off field issues, but they managed to come back in the game and has built some consistency and now become a strike player for 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 the dogs on the edge and creating opportunities for them to be able to score tries, but. Between their hunger and the desire to turn up for each other defensively, even if they come out of the line and they bump off one, it doesn't matter. There's someone else there next to them. And I think they're creating something similar to what the Panthers have. And I said that earlier. But I watched their grand final. Have they played South in the grand final up at Suncorp? Yep. And uh, So the Penrith Panthers attacked the South team and they just flew out of the line and they would bang off someone and Fish Harris would come out and hit someone, but Moses Leota would be there or Liam Martin will be there and they'll cover it up. And before they know it, they've only made 30 metres. And I feel like this is where the Bulldogs are, are going, is that Josh Curran comes flying out of the line, Reid Marnie uh, comes flying out of the line, and between the, the group of them, they just whack, 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 and they're just turning up for each other. And I think that's going to be the big difference when it comes to these finals games. Get through these next six, and let's see where the where the Bulldogs can take the game. But it's exciting for the Bulldogs fans, because, man, they've been some... Been through some troubles over the years and haven't been able to, you know, get the coach or the team that they have wanted to. But with Gus Gould, um, he's been able to, I guess, trust in the system and the pathways that they're trying to set up. Uh, someone like Benji would love to have someone like Gus Gould be by your side and guide you through this next transition phase of not only coaching, but develop- developing these next generation of kids coming through because the Tigers have got some young kids as well. But they have a, a group of not too many big names, and no disrespect to, to the Bulldogs, because they've got some gun players through there. Kick out's been awesome for them. Obviously, Crowden, the big signing. Uh, Matt Burden, who's been really good, and Reed Money through the middle. So they've got some big names through there, but they have just turned up, and they've got an attitude and a will and a want to attack the opposition. And that's what will get them through to the back end of the season and the, and the higher positions for sure. And you have those games sometimes where everything just goes your way, yeah. where everything you try it works and talk about yeah. the kick and being there. And some of that you've got to take from the opposition as well. Yeah. But when Reed Barney kicks that ball across and Connor Tracy, what a take. Yeah. One-handed take. He, he got himself a hat-trick as yeah, well. Yeah, he was awesome. Um, you know, and then to finish off the game, to ice it off 38 metres out, Matt Burton just says, I'll oh, drop the kick over. Good practice. Like nothing. Great like practice. nothing. Just sometimes you've got to ride that. Ride it out and win. When everything's going your way, just keep it going. Yeah, awesome. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on Skelton there on the wing and that combination with Kiraz out there? Because I think it was him that did the catch and then the flick out. Yeah, he, he was enormous. Um, you know, uh, the place is full of belief right now. The place is full of belief and confidence and someone like him coming in, jumping on the back of already the momentum that he has. He was enormous for them on the edge as well. And I think between, you know, the K- Kiraz and what he's been able to create this year, like he's come out of nowhere as well. But it's, it's the confidence, it's the belief in the players around you, it's the belief in the coach, it's all these things. And that's who they're playing for right now. They're playing for a coach that believes in every single player that when they get out on the field, they play that way. And um, 
those guys that come in and get a job done, similar to these good clubs, um, on the back of what they've been able to create so far, the dogs, they've been able to perform at their best. Like, there were some great runs by Skelton down the outside there. He's putting himself, he's competing, you know, and Carraz, 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 Carraz always is competing for high balls. He's a, he's a target in the air and he's working really hard. So between those guys on the outside backs, you know, I mean, you get Stephen Crichton back, he, he just adds more value to that. Connor Tracy, we spoke about, like, He's been enormous. He's been enormous. Yes, yeah, Skelton and Wilson have been two good yes, finds. Yes, Wilson, yeah. Um, for them on the flanks. And, of course, they've got Adokar mm. still waiting. <laughs> so, yeah, they've they've got a, a richness as far as their depth and personnel, what they've been able to bleed through and give some of those young fellas some experience mm. this year. So, yeah, they're taking their opportunities uh, with both hands. Yeah. On the Broncos side, do they pack up things now and start planning on how they're going to make a comeback next season or like is it season over oh i know because i th still think they're in a, a position to 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 challenge uh to challenge and for them is is it's i think it's changing their mindset um and a lot of these games now all come down to your defense and i think if you you sort out your defense we always know that the broncos can attack but understand that everyone else is trying to do the same thing as well. So you've got to be the best that you can be individually. And then as a team, and it comes down to preparation, it comes down to training, it comes down to doing your homework on the opposition. It's understanding what's coming at you so that you can prepare to, prepare to be the best when you get on the field. So I don't think it's over for the, for the Brisbane Broncos. There's a long way to go yet for them. Um, but again, it nearly comes down to win every single match, which is most probably from from the Warriors up and just below the Warriors that and the Titans who are on 20 points, like every game's a must win and every other team in them is thinking the same thing. So I don't think it's over for, for the Brisbane Broncos, but they're going to be having to have to dig deep for each other to put themselves uh, in the position to be able to get challenge at the end of the year. Yeah, I think from Gold Coast, Knights, Warriors... Uh, down to the Titans, all around there. Mm. Um, until it's mathematically impossible, then I think you've got to keep swinging. Mm. You've got to keep throwing it out there every single week. Um, Souths, we've been saying it for a long time. Yeah, The Broncos, they're in there now. They've got to win every single game. You've got to rely somewhat on other, other teams losing. You've got to chasing it every single week, and you've fought long and hard. We're back. We are just there. We're just there. We fought. Yeah, they fought long and hard throughout preseason up until now. You're not going to throw it away no. and, and wave the white flag at all. You're going to keep going. And I think that's, that's what the Broncos will do. You'll, you'll see some teams show some character. Sweet as, yeah. Up the Bulldogs. I'm going to have uh, my jerseys on its way back to New Zealand. I'm now a Bulldogs fan. <laughs> uh, this guy, yeah, he's straight up. <laughs> <laughs> Moving along to the Cowboys versus the Sharks. Uh, 30 to 22 to the Cowboys. Kyle Felt, the old man, getting it done on the wing, whipping out some arguably old man celebrations, but he got it done for the Cowboys. Yeah, um, they're, a, they're a great attacking side, and I think on the back of, you know, Tommy Dearden, Drinkwater, Townsend, um, I think they're an exceptional side when they get things going. And I know. When he plays, he's a strong carrier of the ball. He's a competitor. Between those four and their young, young outside backs, I think they're doing a, a great job. Um, they, they need, like like everyone else, keep winning, um, keep being consistent, and manage to come away with a strong win. I thought they attack-wise, they were really good in attack. Um, again, everyone needs to sharpen up the defence because at times, you know, some easy tries are scored. But in the same time, uh, that I thought the. The Cowboys were a quality side uh, and having to win, and I guess Todd Payton will be happy with how they're performing right now. Yeah, he will be. He'll be really happy that they're, they're still around there. They're, st they're still alive as far as their contention hopes to play in the playoffs, and they've got a very good record mm. um, against the the Sharks, which for Craig Fitzgibbon will be really disappointed yeah. about. And they had every reason to chase after it. Big win last week. Yeah. Needed to try and back that up. Uh, contenders they're playing against. Yeah. The, these are the games in preparation for your playoffs. If you're going to get there, you've got to be sharpening your axe against them. But unfortunately, they're just too much about them, um, the Cowboys, and their edge is very, very good. Josh Drinkwater, again, yeah. fantastic with the ball. Tom Dearden had another day out for them. 
Um, just some concerns. Uh, we spoke about how good Tom Alolo has been going. He's yeah. back to finding some form again. Injured. Just got an injury that could keep him out for the season. That could be telling yeah. for for the Cowboys because he's been so influential. Great that they got Murray Taolangi back. Got to got to try early on in the game. They need their big names. They're they're another team that needs all their big guns out playing for them. Well, I think you know the, sh- the Sharks. And I think this has been this season. What what's helped the Sharks is. They started so well, so they're setting themselves in a really good position, and that's the importance of the competition is is that your first 10 rounds or your first 12 rounds, you have to try and get as many wins as you can because as people, as teams build momentum, as teams build consistency, they start playing the way that they want to play, and they're very lucky that they're sitting where they are because of what they created early in the season. But neither to say, like there is teams knocking on the door, and they they haven't been consistent enough in that position. So they're sitting in the position because of how they started the season. But now we understand that the the, the comp is changing, and the games are getting tougher and tougher. You're not seeing these big blowout scores, or if you do, both teams are scoring a lot of points. Um, the games are getting tighter. Um, but then these are teams are building momentum on the back of their attack, on the back of their defence, and the Cowboys are one of those teams who. We know at the start of the season they had all the attack defensively they were poor, but they've they've tried to tighten that right up, and now they're getting in the performance that they did. You know the Sharks, there's some some great players through that team, but again the consistency week in week out to perform that the best with the players that they have hasn't been up to par to where they should be on on the ladder. Um, so understand that every team's coming for every win, and you know the Cowboys will be happy where they are because again if you speak about Jace Tomalolo, we said that. He was coming into some flying form, uh, big carries, getting back to what he, what we know he can do, and then obviously pulling up with an injury. Uh, but they've got some young kids up there that are that are just as big as him that can carry the ball. Griffin Neem needs to go up another gear for them. Uh, you know the outside backs, uh, young outside backs are coming in, and then obviously. I don't know if we the, the news of um, Val, Valentine's Holmes uh, is now, and we missed that one early on the show. Um, contract Catherine, contract talks that he's been allowed to negotiate or go out and look for another team. Yep. So we'll do that job for you, Ephraim, as well. Uh, so Valentine <laughs> Holmes last night on on the rugby league was what it was breaking news on the half time that um, that the Cowboys have allowed him to go out there and look for an opportunity <coughs> if he can find one. Uh, yep. So that's huge news for, for the Cowboys as well because he's been a great servant for them. Um, he's a goal <coughs> kicker. He's a match winner. He's an origin player. Um, he's an international. Um, and now that there's these kids that are coming in and getting jobs done and I guess salary cap pressures, this is what it causes as well. So to be able to hold guys that are worth a lot of money it's getting really hard in the game now that these young kids are coming through and having to not have to pay so much for those guys when you've got a lot of guys on big money. Jason Tamalolo, for example, as well, for the 10-year the contract that he has that's on, you know, what they say is a million bucks a season. Valentine Holmes is quite similar as well. So there's an opportunity now for Val to be out there and looking, and that's where the Cowboys have gone. So um, interesting space because I want to see how he performs on the back of this now because... You know, it does subconsciously play on your mind. And now that the club's come out and made that public, that you're you're um, on the outer or you've got an opportunity to go and look, uh, whether he can knuckle down and just go, hey, whatever happens now, I'm going to go out there and perform the best I can and try and get try and secure in a contract. And again, the Dragons are in every single conversation at the moment about signing some players. And, you know, imagine if they get him in there as well. I think that's another great signing. Yeah, I will say that. Chris or his manager did come out this morning and did say that the Cowboys were still in the race. Yeah. And then they just haven't opened yeah. talks with them yet. They haven't had the conversation. But yeah, the Com- Cowboys, when a club gives you permission to talk yeah. and go t- go to market, that's usually a sign that you know they're ha- they're happy for you to go and and move on. But the fact that Chris Orr is saying, no, we just haven't opened talks. We're hoping yeah. still to stay at the Cowboys. And I think the Cowboys fans will be hoping that's the mm. case as well. Yeah. He's such a good player. But you know, talk about the Sharks and banking wins and, and getting themselves secure there. Well, they're not secure yet. No. The Dogs are coming after them. Yeah. Talking about the Dogs in fifth place, they're right after them. And we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But they've got to keep an eye on what's happening with the Dolphins. Mm. You know, those wins aren't secure yet. You've got to keep winning in order yeah. to keep yourself. Top four is so big. Top four so big in the playoffs. It's the most important part of our competition now, eh, is getting that second chance come first week of finals and, and knowing that if either whether you're one, two, three or four is knowing that you've only got one 
big game that you have to win so that you get the week off to play a semi and then a GF is better than playing, losing the first week, playing the second week, playing the next week and then a GF. Like, it's it's hard. And I don't think it's been done. Like, I think the Cowboys done it from the outside getting the grand final, but I think the Storm cleaned them up and it was it's too hard. The competition's too no. tough. The games are, are played at finals intensity and you can't do four no. games straight and then try and play a final. Especially for the Sharks and Craig Fitzgibbon, who I think they've won one playoff game yeah. in the last two or three years. Yeah. and It's not a good record. Mm. I apologise for the oversight uh, on the Val Holmes situation. Uh, the news train runs a bit slower over here in Samoa, I guess. Oh, Samoa, yeah, I guess. Nah, you my bro. We got you. We got you. <laughs> uh, moving along to the Roosters versus Seagulls. 34-30 uh, to the Roosters. Early on looked like it was going to be sort of uh, the Roosters when they played the Warriors, with blowing them out early. But man, three intercept tries and a real comeback from the Seagulls changed the look of that game. Yeah, definitely. And um, man, the opportunity right at the end for Manly to take the game away from the Roosters, that was exciting for me. Um, it was the intercepts that gave, put them back into the position, but you still have to put yourselves in those positions. You watch the first half and you think, well, you know, the Roosters are just going to blow them off the park and put a cricket score on these guys. And they were playing a great brand of attacking football. Tedesco was involved. Um, everyone was involved in the team. Um, so when you saw the score, you're thinking, where did the Seagulls come back into this game? And you look for their strike. You look for who's going to make a difference. Um, Cherry Evans is always the, the key for me is when he's playing well or when he's moving the team around and enjoying himself, they're playing some great footy. And those three intercepts make the game a contest right at the end. And it was an exciting game for me. And I think, you know, if there's one that excited me the most, uh, it was that one. I sat there and I thought, oh, it's over. And I snuck away for like five minutes and then they scored an intercept try and then they go back and get another one and there's three. And I'm thinking, wow, this game could be anything by the end of it. And very unlucky are very lucky for the Roosters to come away with this one. They'll be disappointed with those moments in those games because if they if there's a better way to choose the option, they would have had their time again. They would have chose the right option. But when I say that, like I said earlier, you've got to put yourselves in those positions. And they, were, I guess, the, the Seagulls were in a position where it was all or nothing. And those if those passes hit their hand and stick. It's a try for, for the Roosters, but they didn't. Che Evans comes and gets that last one. And some of these these breaks, although the effort was there for chasing him down, like Che Evans is a bit of an older guy, and you think he's going to get caught here, but he just, the determination, desire to get themselves back in those positions to try and win the game, enormous from, from the Seagulls. Obviously, he wouldn't be happy with the start defensively. Uh, to allow an uh, attacking side like the Roosters, and who you know they're going to come out and play football, needs to be better. I think, you know, between those guys, uh, between all the Roosters players with their spine, as Luke Carey's been important to them. Uh, Sam Walker's been enormous with his kicking game. Tough little player. I like what he's doing. And there's still conversations around, are the Roosters going to keep him there? Because, man, you'd be chucking something at him because he's the future. Oh, I think he's the future of that club and you can build a team around him and what he's been able to create. They're, they're losing Luke Carey. They're bringing in Chad Townsend, who's a bit of an older star. But at the same time, Sam Walker's your man. Um, the things he can do, the attacking football that he plays, the excitement, the options that he chooses, is normally the right one every time. His kicks over to the corner. When there's ever a break, that's normally the first thing he thinks. He gets the ball, looks to the wing, two pros over there. Bang. Hits him every time. Nine times out of eight, ten times out of ten, he hits the right mark. Uh, short kicking game, second to none. He's a competitor. Smaller guy, gets the job done. So you build a team around him. I can't believe they still haven't sorted him out. Maybe he's on the outer. Maybe he's off to the Bronx, back to the Queensland state. Um, but, yeah, the Roosters will be happy with the result. Not happy with their, their, the defensive resolve in the second half and those options, that some of those options that, with the intercepts that they got. Yeah, I think you'll be ecstatic, ecstatic with their first half. Yeah. And especially how they started the game. We, we always talk about getting off to a start, get off to a fly, put some pressure on the opposition, but then look to go on with it. Mm. And, um, Tedesco was outstanding to start awesome. the game. Scored a try, set up one, put a Dom Young away. Swaliti was dangerous down that yeah. side, but came off, as you said, great works that Sam Walker was doing, threatening, bro broke him up through the middle. But then they come out second half and just get a bit wayward. And Manly had no right, as you said, to get mm. back into it. But Tommy Talao yep. gets an intercept and goes 60, 70 metres. And then 
the old man, Cherry Evans, gets one. And just something, especially the Cherry Evans one, I just thought the Kiri pass was sloppy. And just needs to play short. He just tried to labour a pass over the top and Cherry Evans plucks it out of the air and goes a distance and made it exciting. Yeah, made, it, made it a great spectacle to watch. But for both teams, we're talking about already six weeks out, preparation for playoff football, as you said, mm. it goes up a level, Yeah, goes up another notch. Those mistakes will punish you yeah. and your season could be over if that's your level of performance. The teams that will go through and contest the grand final will be the two best defensive teams because defence sets your intensity mm. and sets your focus. And that's where, unfortunately, for the other teams where Melbourne and yeah. Penrith are at at the moment. Yeah. They're the pace setters defensively. They're not scoring as many points as the Roosters, but it's all about your D. Yeah, and yeah, you you, you say you choose the right. That's the right points because we all know defence wins competitions, and um, the two teams at the top of the table are the ones that are working really hard. And again, you're seeing the Bulldogs on the rise on the back of their defence. Hey, so. These teams that are scoring all the points, it's all well and good scoring all these points, but defensively you have to tighten everything up. And it's an opportunity in these next six weeks to do that, is to execute, is to choose the right option, is to not get tired and lazy and throw those balls over the top. It's to, to steal, steal up your focus and focus on defence. Um, and as we spoke about it for the Warriors, is that's where the focus should be. It's not about the attack. Everyone can attack, we know that. But at the moment... If you can sort out your defence, it's going to keep you in the games more often than not. And we're coming to the back end. The competition gets tougher. The guys, teams are wanting to win games. Defence will hold you in good stead for the back end of the competition. And, mate, that's where the comps won. That's where the comps won. What do you guys reckon about the criticism of the Roosters being uh, bottom of the ladder bullies? So this was only their second game that they've beat any of the top eight, current top eight teams. And they haven't lost to anyone that's not in the top eight right now. Yeah, and that's I think that's what the Roosters have have built their 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 style of football around. If you look at the players through the middle of the park, when Jared's there, you know you got Victor Radley, you got all these young guys coming through um, that are aggressive players. And so when it comes to playing the Roosters, they'll try and out bully you through the middle of the park, and then allow. Sam Walker, Luke Carey, Tedesco, run, ride it, run, riot through the middle of the park and, and score points. And then out wide, be able to kick to, to Tupo Soali, who's an athletic player, can catch balls in the air. So uh, I think that I don't think that's criticism. I think that's a, a well known stat that that's how the, the Roosters play. I think every time I've played them in, in the years that I played, is that you always knew it's going to be a physical battle. Um, they have players in there that are physical. So not only that they're coming out to bully you, they're coming out to, to, to get one on top of you. So, but you have, that's the way the game's going. It's one, the battle is won through the middle of the park. If you don't win the middle of the park, your guys in the outside don't allow them, or your halves don't allow them to play football and score points. So the, the Roosters aren't going to change the way they're playing. And I think the Chris, there shouldn't be any criticism. It's, well, it's a well-known stat for, for a long time that they are the bullies when it comes to playing playing rugby league in the NRO. And I think alongside Parramatta Eels, who play a similar style of, you know, your your Junior Paulos, um, your Campbell Gill Campbell Graham Gill or Campbell Gillard. What's his name? Far. Regan Campbell Gillard. Regan, 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 Regan Campbell Gillard. Regan Campbell Gillard. I've got that all mixed up. Regan Campbell Gillard. Um, those guys are a powerhouse. They try and play a brand of football where they bully you guys. So I think it's 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 not a cr criticism. It's a known fact. That's how they play. Yeah, and you're talking about the table and the teams underneath them. There's games that you must win, and they're doing that. Um, they're getting the job done against those teams. But the question mark was really posed last week, I thought, when they when they lost to the, the Storm. Storm. And, yeah. you know, their ability to challenge those teams around them and be bullies to mm. those teams above them, that's yeah. the question yeah. mark about the Roosters. That's the yeah. real question. Um that everybody's asking if they are to be genuine title contenders. Are they going to step up? As we said, in the intensity of finals football, when it matters, when it counts, are they building themselves up to that? I'm not sure about that at the mm, moment. No, haven't seen it. Haven't seen it yet. And and you, you're right there, Willie, is can they step up to the big boys when it comes to the big games and bully those guys through the style of football that they play rather than bullying these teams below them, which they got to do in you know, to win, 
but we haven't seen them take on a, a, a Melbourne Storm or a Penrith Panthers and outmuscle them um, or outplay them. So the, the test and the challenge is still there for the Roosters, whether they are the real contenders this year and challenging for, which you look through their pack, of course, their, their, their team is is world class. It's it's There's some great players through there. So, yeah, they've still got a, a fair way to go to play with the big dogs when it comes to, you know, this NRL ladder. Yep. And you speak about the Penrith Panthers, and they are definitely warming themselves up into the finals off the back of Nathan Cleary. Man, whatever he did in his break worked because he's been the best player by far in his first two games back off of his injury. Uh, they just destroyed the Dragons, 46-10. to 10. Yeah, he was he was better this week for me uh, than the week before. Obviously, those clutch moments that he had the week before and won won the game with his droppy. I think again, like most of these players coming back, Cameron Munsters and, and obviously Cleary, it's consistency in being in the team. But we always know what Nathan Cleary can deliver. It's and, and I guess now the expectation is set is this is what we want to see every single week from him, and he delivers it every time. Um, he was again. A big difference for that team uh, with his kicking game, his running game. He's a strong fella for a little dude. I remember playing against him and he was quite hard to, to grab onto. And you can see where that, that he's obviously scored a hat-trick. One of those tries where he dummied, got through the back row, scored a try, ducked under, spun out of the fullback and scored a try. So I think like having him back uh, brings a lot of uh, confidence um, to the team and the people around him. But then also you watch Jerome Luai jump around and have a little bit more fun when, when he knows his, his partner in crime is back in the field. But then also on the back of that, the outside backs are doing their job. The middle forwards are playing real tough. Um, they're going up against a, a St. George team, I think, again, has had a, a season like most other clubs. Is It's up and down. They're finding consistency. They haven't been able to turn up in the big games. Uh, they win the games that they need to win. But when it comes to the better teams, like the Penrith Panthers, like they just can't get the job done. Uh, so, an exciting, exciting time. And and I think we've both said like I don't see anyone beating the Melbourne Storm and the Penrith Panthers right now. And if, if we throw it right out there, I reckon they're going to be the two teams competing at the end of the day for the big prize because of how they perform against these teams. And no matter who they are, yes, they're still building. I think, but man, that was a dominant performance all over. They were class again off the back of what Nathan's be able to create on his second game back from a long time on the sidelines. Yeah, the Dragons at home would be disappointed to perform that way. And you could see they had a couple of people trying to fire them up. Ben Murdoch Masilla tried mm. to spark him and get him going, but they've got a lot about him. And the headlines were Nathan scoring the hit, um, scoring the hat trick, but it was what he was able to do off the ball mm. and how he creates space for so many players around his kicking game, as you said, his football now and how to play the game at the right times, you know, when to punch it through, when to take them on, when to run, when to pass. Um, the other thing for them is they've lost some experience over the last couple of years. They've mm. lost Crichton. Um, Tungle's been injured for a while. They lost uh, Kick out. May. They lost Kickout. Um, but you get people like... Uppy. Uppy Crossout. You get guys like um, Jesse McLean coming yep. through. And, you know... Just their, their nursery is just what they do. Their system at first grade level is just embedded all the way yep. through. So when that next crop, that next fella's called up, one, he's got an ability because mm. he's, he's playing for a great system, but he also knows what his responsibilities are and what yeah. his role is. They just uh, a bit like Melbourne. They yep. are the two at the top. Yeah. for what they do. And I think other teams got to look deeply at what they've got at their system yeah. and what their culture is because there's, there's no coincidence that both teams are at the top of the table. Yeah, or I think, you know, it's a, for me, and excuse me, language, it's a no dickhead policy, eh? And I think when people turn up, they know what that is and what that isn't. And they know what that looks like, not only from being in there, but on the outside. So when you get an opportunity to go down to these clubs, um, you either fit into the system and fit into the culture or you find yourself out of there real quickly. And everyone that goes there understands that already just by watching what they've been able to create over the years and the pathways that they've been able to have. So you either turn up there with the attitude that I want to get better or they will quickly move you on real quickly at both clubs. And I think I'm, I'm just talking from my, my time at the Melbourne Storm and knowing what they talk about and how they think and the culture that they've been able to embed into their over the years since Craig Bellamy turned up in 2003, that 
you either buy in or you see yourself out. And I think that's what um, you know Penrith's been able to create too, the Melbourne Storm, and these are the two 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 big clubs. But it's it's an environment I feel like to learn and grow. That's what I feel like they create a place uh, where you can grab the opportunity, but also to grow as a footballer and as a human. They're good people down in the Melbourne Storm, and I don't know too much about Penrith Panthers, but a lot of the staff are players that have been in the system before that have started when Craig Bellamy come down. Your Ryan Hinchcliffe was there, your Ryan Hoffman's were there. You know, um, Craig Bellamy's son is now sitting in the box with them. So these guys, and in the, along with the Penrith Panthers, they just have a system where people just understand and get it. And then when they go there, no matter what the name of the player is, and like we've seen these kids coming through the Penrith yeah. Panthers system, they just know what it looks like and what it takes to win. Hey, there's a winning culture there now that every time someone comes in for an opportunity, you want to excel, but you know you're going to excel because you've been taught the right way and you, you understand the game and you, you, you're confident in your ability. You've got belief in what you're doing. So you get out there and you play the way that they do what you've done. They also have lost so many players over the years. You know, after Cooper Cronk and Billy Sladd and Cameron Smith and Greg Inglis and Israel Folau and all those boys and Ryan Hoffman, they're gone. And Adam Blair. You know, the, the, the big four is gone. You know what I mean? Oh, you know, they're not going to be any good anymore. Yeah. But wait, they, they've kicked on. For Jesse sure. Bromwich, Felice Cavusi, Kenny Bromwich, Kevin Proctor, Tohu Harris. Like, all these guys have come through a system and everyone would have just gone, wait, they, they're no chance. And they bring in the new age of group, Jerome Hughes, Munster. You know, those guys have come through and now creating what they've done. So these, I'm just talking about the culture of these two clubs and, and where they sit above the rest. Bulldogs are starting that. And the danger for everyone else is, yeah, you're right, Ephraim. Um, he, he got better this week, Nathan Cleary. But in his two games, been outstanding. But he's also rested. Yeah. He's rested he's and fresh. Fire he's fresh for a run home. Yeah. You know, Penrith are so dangerous now. You know what? I think something similar happened to him last year. I think he got injured around similar timings last year. And on the back of that, blew, blew the game out of the park and, you know, the best play on the ground in most games. So I feel like this becomes a bit of a trend for Well, for, that's the big him. silver lining through his injuries. He's, he's rested and that's, that's, fresh. You know, when you've got your key players that are play a key part into your team and the role for the Penrith Panthers like him is making sure that they're well rested, making sure that the timing's right. You know what I mean? No one wishes them to get injured. But when they get injured, is what you do in that time to make sure that you're ready to go to have the best back end of the season that you can possible. Because now he's only got six games to go. And then into the finals, could be only three more games, and you know, two more games in there and, and a grand final. Crazy. Yeah, so shout out to uh, Mary Fowler and the Matildas uh, <laughs> over in the Olympics. Hey, very, very lucky. <laughs> but on the Dragons very side. Very lucky. <laughs> they got very lucky. On the Dragon side, um, they have kind of fallen off. They were a bit more electrifying earlier in the season when Zach Lomax was in that origin uh, form that got him into the team. Ben Hunt, he's still leading the tri for the NRL. But they've kind of fallen away ever since, I think, that 60-point loss to the Roosters. They're sort of stumbling. They might end up further down the ladder. What do you think is the issue for them at the moment? Yeah, I think for our Warriors fans that tune in, uh, they're, they're, I guess a lot of Warriors fans are riding home these teams to lose, eh? Uh, and Dragons are one of them. Um, I think, you know, a, as a as a group, they haven't been able, like you just mentioned a few players, that they have been good, but collectively as a group, they haven't been up to par. Uh, Lomax is trying, um, but when confident, and I go back to the confidence thing all the time, and when the confidence is going well, uh, Zach Lomax, for example, everything's flying. You know, he got, what was he, fullback on the weekend? So he, he gets shifted around. He's been dominant on the winger. Now he's fullback. You know, arguments about centre position. And I think a lot of the, I guess, I reckon it's the off field. It's the, it's the pressure from the off field about, especially in Sydney. You know what I mean? Like they should be better, better off where they are because where they sit on the table. But again, like you said, from on that, that Roosters, I don't think they've found some consistency on the back of that. Yes, the coaches come in and change their mindset, and they've been better. They've been better and they've won some really good games and, and played some quality football. But the consistency for me, both defence and attack, and that's for like a lot of the teams in below these guys at the top, that's where it comes down to. Execution, uh, poor handling errors, discipline. You know, those three things together, uh, position of the ball, like completing your sets. If you don't do any of those five things in the game, you're always going to find yourself struggling against the quality sides or any team. So... 
They need to fix up, and like most teams below them, errors, discipline, high completions. You get those right defensively, and then you're 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 challenging these better teams. And personnel, personnel mm. is another one. They're trying to recruit with Damien Cook coming in. They've got a fantastic international quality hooker to add to that. And yeah, I think a big one is Shane Flanagan, mm. first season in charge, trying to change things. You look back. Cameron Serrata, he hasn't been able to do it overnight. It didn't take Ivan Cleary overnight. You know, he had to work at it. They had a season where they struggled a little bit before they hit their form and become the champion team they are. So give the Dragons some time. You know, mm. I still think for them, where they are and where they've been, I think this is a successful season. Yeah. Moving on to the Dolphins versus the Titans. Uh, 21-14 to the Titans. I mean, after a horrible start to the season, as we covered, they've come back and they're sort of escaping out of that bottom three, leaving behind the Rabbitohs, the Tigers, the Eels. And now they, they actually level on points with the Broncos, which is pretty funny because they play each other next week. So uh, that will be a great game. But anyways, they came back and dispatched of uh, the Dolphins. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, great win for the Titans. Um, they, yeah, they had to fight themselves back into this game. Uh, but the Dolphins in the second half, poor. Uh, I think they completed four sets. Uh, I think they were way off par when it comes to completion. And we just spoke about that uh, well, as well as most teams wanting to be, you know, position, completion, errors. Um, they lost the game. Um, they, they started well. They started well. They looked like they had a bit of strike going on. And then second half, they come out of the gates. And I think we saw some footage of Des Hasler just ripping into the, the Gold Coast Titans. And I was like, holy hecka, he's animated. And, you know, you haven't seen any of that stuff since um, Michael Maguire was um, blowing up the West Tigers when he was there. And this is, you know, all Kevy Walters to the Brisbane Broncos this year. Um, but whatever he said in that, in that shed, they came out and played some footy. And they needed to, but... The Dolphins were poor, poor with their execution, poor with their handling errors, and their completion was way off, you know what I mean? But there's some individuals there that are playing some really good footy, but what's letting them down and what's letting down these teams at the lower end of the table is the, the handling errors, and it's been real discipline with these things. So, you know, credit for the Titans to hang in there with the experience of Kieran Foran and some of those outside backs that can score tries from out of anywhere. Um, they got the win. Dolphins would be... Um, you know, filthy that they let that one go in the second half. But they only have themselves to blame through their, through their errors. Yeah, and even at 14-0 um, at half-time, or yeah. leading into going into half-time, I still didn't think yeah. they were crash hot. Mm. You know, they got, I'll say they got lucky, but they jagged a try off a bounce. Yeah. The Gold Coast should have taken the kick. Yeah. Uh, to Vita Pangai yeah, Jr. Yeah. picks it up and he scores the opening try and... Some of their timing, some of their plays, the execution of their plays weren't quite on the money. Mm. So there were some signs, but I think uh, deceptive how much they were leading by. Yeah. And fooled them a little bit. But it didn't fool Des Hasler. As he said, he gave an old-fashioned spray, a bit like the one he gave Manly yeah. when he ripped the door the, off the handle at Parramatta. Yeah. And it worked. It worked. It got straightened them back up. They come out. They... They still played some footy, which yeah. I liked. They still got the ball into Keanu Kinney's hands. He was trying things. Yeah. I thought the, the pass, the play, when they kicked it off and they shifted out to Fafida, yeah. oh. outstanding play. Yeah. I, I, I was like the commentators. I felt for Hammer yeah. being one-on-one -on -one with yeah, him rampaging yeah. David Fafida and just bumped straight out of him. But our man... Luffy Carpereira yes. scored again. Still going. Keep going, son. <laughs> Keep getting us up there. We need a couple of tries. 39 tries, I think, now. Out of 30, 20, 37 games. 37 games, So yeah. it could be the fastest to 40 tries. So, yeah, outstanding on the wing. You've got a massive t um, try scoring rate. But the Gold Coast, their turnaround in their season, again, a bit like the Dragons, coach is starting to put his imprint well and truly on the team. And, yeah. you know, he's uh, really making his mark and he made that known at half time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the outside backs for me that are that are the threat for the for the um, Gold Coast Titans along with Fafida. When they're confident and when they're playing football, Keanu Kinney, Brian Kelly, um, Jojo Fafida, um, Khan Pereira, 
those boys, when they get the ball in the hand, anything can happen. You see Brian Kelly just sniffing around the middle of the puck. And every time he's at, at dummy half, both him and Fafia, they're picking up and running. They ain't passing the ball. And that's when they're most at their danger or most at their threat is when they get the ball and they just skip across, skip across and wait for someone to hit the line. And then they disrupt the defensive line. If you don't keep a straight line, they poke their nose through. Then a quick play of the ball comes off it. So I think alongside you know those guys, if they can build some momentum, most some momentum, they are definitely challenging. They're on 20 points. I think, again, for the Warriors fans, they needed Gold Coast Titans to win that one, uh, but now they sit right below them. They're on 20, Warriors on 21. Um, they didn't need Dolphins to win. I'm just doing trying to do the math here for the Warriors fans out there. So every single game's a, a game that they have to win, but those teams above them need to lose, but at some point they're going to be playing each other where they knock each other out. So... Um, yeah, the outside backs are their threat, and with obviously the the old stager, the fossil, Kieran Fawn, getting them around the park. Um, I think they're a, <laughs> they're a, a, a team to watch out for on this back end with these playing these last six games for sure. Yeah, we mentioned it earlier in the season. Winning is a habit, and so is losing. Unfortunately for the Dolphins, they're in that yeah. habit right in there at the moment. I yeah. don't know how they get to stop it because. Very interesting to see Wayne Bennett in the post-match press conference talking about their second halves mm. and how they're capitulating, almost lost. You know, just I don't know. He didn't know where it was going. We yeah. had to stop it. You know, from where they are in the first half, whilst not perfect, to fall away like that is a big concern. Well, you, you go away from your. I don't know, I'm not saying they went away from their game plan, but. Some of the errors are individual stuff. So those guys fix those up. They don't drop the ball. They don't make any errors. They overplay. If you're overplaying and you play short and he drops the ball, sometimes you've got to catch those balls as well. So when things just don't go to go the way that they want, it just becomes a bit of a snowball effect. And the confidence just drops and you go, oh, not this again. And then on the back of previous weeks, if you haven't performed in the back half, subconsciously it's in your mind. The coach is talking about it. He has no answers. You're seeing that, you're reading that, you're hearing it from the outside, and then you're going, hold on a minute, we can't get the second half done subconsciously. You're not going into the game thinking, oh, we can't get it done. So you go away from what you normally would do, whether you just overplay or you play too early or too late and you put them into a, a tough position to play. But they've got the strike to be able to compete too. And I think, you know, they're a great a team to watch play footy. They spread the ball too. They like playing through the middle of the park, but they got some strike on the edges. So... I guess they, they go into the second halves to play a similar styles, but when it gets tough, what does that look like for the Dolphins? I think that's where they've got to say, like, if we drop three balls, what do we do next? How do we get ourselves out of this little hole? How do we win back momentum? Uh, and what momentum would, may, it may just be five hit-ups for a kick to the corner, everyone chase. You know what I mean? So I think there's there's situations in games where teams like the Dolphins, if you're not, if you're, and I'm not the coach, but if you're not in this in the systems where it's just like, all right, we know how it is. We've got our leaders. All right, switch our focus. First three tackles, first set, win the set. We're going to kick long, and then we're all going to get the chase in and try and win the first tackles and then try and build momentum on the back of that. So if they're not in that mindset, if they haven't got the leaders strong enough to be able to understand that, which I think they do, Jesse Bromwich, Kenny Bromwich, who come out of a system where everything um, sits around defence and being really tight in defence, they're not being able to push that hard enough as a team then their second halves are going to continue to be the way they are. So again, we spoke about the whole whole this whole show about defence. Defence wins comps, and if they can't get the defence right, they can't come out with the steel focus in the second half. Then it's going to continue to do this. I think a big loss for them, and it's reared its head. And Max Plath's been outstanding oh, for them. Huge. But Jeremy Marshall King's a huge loss for them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Since his injury, their fall away has been significant. Well, he's the creativity around the middle of the park, eh? And any time you have momentum, the nines become the most important, part, most important glue to your team. And if you've got a quality player like Jerry Marshall King sitting on the sidelines with his creativity off the back of momentum, it opens up the space for Cody and Isaiah Katoa to be able to play the play the way that they do. So if you don't have your guy, Matt Path, I think he's been enormous, can play everywhere on the field and tough too. So, you know, he's going well, but they do miss someone of Jerry Marshall King's stature to be able to create that creativity around the middle of the park yep. for their forwards and their halves to be able to do what they do. We'll move along to the last game of the round, uh, the Raiders versus the Rabbitohs, 32-12 to the Raiders. And I was before singing the praises, obviously, of Nathan Cleary and his return. Very good. The best player in the NRL. But 
it kind of overshadows also the return of Jamal Fogarty and how influential he is for them. I mean, he's come back, they've won two games, one of them hard fought, this one a bit of a domination. And like th this is showing why they got to first place on the ladder in round seven, because that was before he got injured. They were one of the best teams. I'm fumbling my words, <laughs> as usually is the case at the end of the episodes, but I just want to give my props to Jamal Fogarty as uh, the key to the Raiders' success. Yeah, as well as mumbling your words, we're just trying to put that together as well through our tightness, <laughs> our ears on what you just said. Um, I know you were speaking about the return of Jamal Fogarty and how important he is to the team on the back of our stuff about Nathan Cleary. Um, we've seen his performance against the Warriors in the excitement of uh, Jordan Rapana and talking about how important his kicking game is to the club. Uh, to the team, and he also showed that again uh, with his game. Uh, we heard through last week's commentary from some of, like, someone like Andrew Johns, you know, and, and Cameron Smith and the Billy Slaters talking about, you know, before he got injured, he was the best kicking, had, he was the best half when it comes to kicking metres in the competition about putting teams in the corners. And he's doing exactly that for the Canberra Raiders as someone that they actually needed to come back. Um, yes, he's important because of that. His leadership, his his calmness, his control helps the the younger boys in his team. When you've got someone like him that can can just rely on him, getting them to where they need to go. His uh, creativity with having his boys and confidence around their back rowers and their middle forwards owning up for me. That's where it's changed for for me with uh, the Canberra Raiders is. Joseph Tabne, Josh Pabali have come out of the blocks in these last couple of weeks, I think, and been the difference for the Canberra's, which they have always been the difference. That's been their power is their, their middle forwards. And then on the back of that, you've got your good, nice attacking back rowers who've got strong feet, can defend well, can score tries out there. And then Jamal Fogarty plays the part of, you know, controller, getting them to the corner and letting the young guys play their shape. But defensively, they're turning up. Um, they're a strong world-minded team who take you to a grind and put you into the grind and that's what they've always been known for and slowly getting that back on the performance that they managed to win against the Warriors but then also now having Jamal Fogarty back that gives confidence to Rappen is on the wing Kyle Weeks is sitting at the back and I heard even in the commentary about you know how good Jordan was at the back and Kyle Weeks is now there and stuff like that but I think it works I think what it does it allows Jordan, again, just to roam like he always does. Nothing really changes for Jordan. Um, the younger legs is going to help in the back end of, of the season. The older legs, you go to the wing, you do what you do, you compete, you can you get stuck in there. And I think alongside him and Jamal Fogarty and, and obviously the younger guys, Kay Weeks at the back, and their back rowers and captain, um, I think they've been enormous the last, you know, especially this one. This one really showed where the Canberra Raiders are at. And, if they can continue on this with the position they are on the ladder like everyone else, there is only up for these guys. Steely, bring back the steel defence, bring back these these front rowers that run over the top of these international and origin front rowers that go over the top of other teams and they'll be put themselves in the position. And I think this is where Ricky Stewart wanted them to be. Yeah, it's amazing to me what a win can do mm. for your confidence. And they scraped a win mm. against the Warriors. Uh but they seemed to have grown so much from that confidence, from that win um, against South Sydney, because I, I didn't give them a chance in this game. I just thought yeah. their home form has been scratchy. That win last week against the Warriors was their first in five games, I think, at yeah. home, and they were back home again. I thought the, the Bunnies, the way they've been going, they're desperate for the win. Yeah. I thought they were going to get it done, but the Raiders, to their credit, didn't allow them. Mm. They never allowed them to get into the game. They were selfish with the ball. I thought Hudson Young was dangerous yeah. every time he got the ball and broken plays, went down the short side to set up the first one. Jordi Rapina looks excited. He yeah. looks young again. Well, you know, bro, when you go from <coughs> running all this meters and it's just it's just a little bit of a mindset thing anyway, and then you go, oh, well, I don't have to do all that stuff. I'm going on the wing. But he still does the same thing. So it's, it's literally just a mindset thing where you just, it's like I've still got free reign. I can still do what I do but I can still have fun and smile and do what he does. So, man, he's enormous, yeah. Yeah, and they, they all look like that. Mm. And as Ephraim was saying, on the back of Jamal Fogarty returning, yeah. taking that pressure off that I thought Adam Reynolds would have done for the Broncos, yeah. and Jamal Fogarty's really stepped up and helping them manage their game. 
yeah. control their game, where they play the game, and put pressure on the opposition, just keep turning them around. You're right, the front row was, was outstanding. I thought Adam Moriota coming off the yes. bench, scored a try. He was fantastic. Mm. So they're punching all the way through from 1 to 17, and I'm glad that they've uh, turned their season around. They could be contenders. It's a, it's a funny time, and we've said this about the Raiders. It's almost a time of the changing of the guard um, with um, Elliot Whitehead moving on. Yeah. to the Dragons next year. Yeah. Not sure what's going to happen with Josh Papali'i. Mm. Jordi Ruppin has come out and said he won't play for anybody else mm. um, other than the Raiders. So it's up to them now. The ball's in their court, whether they offer him a contract at all or what type of contract mm. to, to keep him there. So there's three very experienced old stages for their side that could be missing. This could be their last hurrah. Who knows what's going on? That adds a bit of motivation for them if that's the case. But the Rabbitohs, yeah, it took a bit of a step backwards the mm. last couple of weeks yeah. from where they've been at and singing the praises of Cody Walker and uh, Jack Whiteman and the halves. And I, that is still the key yes. for them. But they've just got to find their running again, find their mojo. Yeah. They lost it for a bit on the weekend. Well, you, you bring Latrell back into the mix. And I guess for those Indigenous boys, there's a close connection, eh, for those fellas. And... Um, you put them in there and they start playing the way that they do play. Again, yes, a step backwards. Um, you know, you'd be happy if you were the Rabbitohs if they finished closer to the eight uh, because of where they started. And you've seen them change and develop through the, the new coach, the, the you know, and being able to create what they've been able to do. The trail change from, you know, where he was at the start of the year to where he is now, Cody Walker, and then the shift to the middle, uh, the shift of the Haas, you know, wide into there, which everyone knew that should have been the combination for him, getting close to the ball. So you'd be happy if they finished closer to the eight rather than the bottom from where they started to. But again, like you said, I think, you know, this week was a bit of a reality check, uh, a team that's um, desperate, and, and they are desperate as well. But... Um, the momentum is now, you know, taking the wind out of their bit of their sails, and teams are working hard now. And that's just the, the the fact and the reality is, is that we're competing for the eight position. And if you're not turning up with the minds and the attitude to go after the game and win the game, then this is can be the result. And, and the world class and the the class players are standing up in the moments where they need them to stand up, which is what their role is and why they get paid so so much money to actually guide a team around. And, and Fogarty's been the key to them. And they were key at the start of the year. He's now the key and he's come back right position. Rested up, but like they think he rested up, come in, build some confidence to the players around him. You know, these young guys that they had, um, Strange and Kai Weeks, got them to this position. Yep. And, you know, you've got to give those guys credit. These young boys have worked their butt off um, to get them in the right position. Yes, it was getting they were getting outclassed, I guess, or you know, the team wasn't connecting as well as they wanted to do. Push one back into the to the fullback position, put them in the leader in there, and this is what the product that they get, eh? and this is where they the confidence grow. And so yeah, a team that's um, you know, you get them to the eight, they they will push you while these guys are firing. And you mentioned those three names, um, these older guys. Um they're playing like it's their last. You know what I mean? Like these last two weeks, I think they've been playing like it's their last. And whether they've spoken about it as a club and and not they may not be saying that they're finished, but hey, we want to finish on a high for, you know, someone like Captain, yep. you know, Elliot Whitehead and, and making sure we send these guys away on, you know, on the right note, whether they're gonna retire or not. But play it play with them like it's your last time. This this group of men will never be together again. So I think they're playing like that where, you know, these guys are stepping up, which is really important that they need to anyway because this is what the competition is now. Um, but they're a threat to be reckoned with if they're in the eight with the quality of players that they have. Yeah, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. We've had 21 rounds already. We've got six rounds to go. Mm. There's so much of the 2024 NRL season narrative and the story yep. to be told in these next six weeks. Yeah. I'm really excited for to see how it shapes up into the runoff to the playoffs. Sure. A um, couple of injuries for the Rabbitohs that are key. Alex Johnston looks like a ruptured, torn Achilles. Oh. And Cody Walker came off early with his calf as well. I mean, man, they just have a... As soon as things have gone right for them, it's turned around. And uh, those are some key injuries. Yeah, they're, they're both key players for the club and 
you know, where, they, where they're sitting now, there's still a chance of poking in there, depending on mathematically on results and stuff like that. But, you know, Cody Walker has been there for the year in, in and out of form, so is Alex Johnson. But those guys play a big part in the South Sydney's team. If they lose those guys, obviously, with Latrell still sitting on the sidelines, um, where do they find that experience to fill that space? Um, you can't expect um, them to be able to carry the experience that they have without those guys on the field. And, and it's going to be a challenge for the back end of the season if they lose those. Oh, well, if he's gone with Achilles, he won't be coming back for the season, depending on... Yeah, you know, Cody Walker's injury will depend on where he comes back, but they need everyone on the field fit and healthy, which is, you know, disappointing from where they've come from, like I said, to where they are now. It's been a huge shift. Yeah, it's a shame for Alex Johnson, but it looked like the classic Achilles. It was out of nothing, it looked like he went to take off to simply carry, carry the footy, but just as his foot left, you could see a little shake, and this is what happens. You, you see a shake when the Achilles snaps it through the calf, and he just collapsed to the ground, and it's unfortunate because it's a horrible, horrible injury yeah. to come back from. Um, and when you're a speedster, there's always a concern, are you going to come back at the same level? Um, but hoping so. He's chasing that try-scoring record, and hopefully he comes back and gets it one day. But Cody Walker is probably the bigger one for mm. me. Whilst it's not as significant an injury as an Achilles he still needs to be out there. Yeah. He needs to be out there. Him and Jack White, they need to be partnering together. Yeah. Last thing on this game, what did you guys think about that after the final buzzer sin bin of Elliot Whitehead? <laughs> For the cynical flop was what they gave it to him. At the end the of the game? game over. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was cynical, and the referee had to, had to sin bin him to make an example of him. Mm. But, yeah, the timing of it, he just did it to, to flop and, and get on him. And like the commentators said, teaching, uh, teasing Nathan Highmarsh about his tackling style, um, he probably had a bit more, few more exaggerated flops than what Elliot Whitehead showed on the weekend, but it was a flop nonetheless. Yeah, it's a flop. I'm just looking off camera at Dylan... Uh because he's clearly disagreeing <laughs> with what you guys are saying. Yeah, but I don't really, I don't really know anything, so you, know, <laughs> you guys just continue. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we got Speak for the people, man. Hey, look, nah. Like, I just stick to my job switching cameras, you know, and trying to work the internet. <laughs> Yeah, you're not like the three of us with our immense banks of knowledge of rugby league, eh? <laughs> well, Fano. All right, uh, boys. Yeah, well, Fano, thank you so much for our guys over in Samoa, first and foremost. Hey, we finally got there, and uh, please excuse, obviously, the breakdown of reception and everything that we've done, but... We're still bringing the beautiful game of rugby league to your ears and your eyes. Myself and Koro Wurumu, please like and subscribe like always. And we'll be back again next Monday to give you more of the action here on Runner Straight. And if I just pause again, that's okay. We're here to give you guys the lovely game of rugby league. Thank you. Please tune in again next week. Cheer!